promise. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Andy Rogers podcast. Another podcast with second podcast with Paul Craig on. And we've got the most bitterest Hearts fan I know. And Begby's main man, Liam Corbett. How are we doing, man? A Hearts fan snowball better. Is that, is that not just what we did? I'm sure we're uh, just better bastards anyway. But I am good, my man, yourself. Aye, good man. Um, just want to say thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for giving me a shout last week. It was top quality. No, no bother, my man. It's good to see you getting something on the go, and that it's good. I think uh, it's good to see folk being creative and being active and stuff like that. It's been up your shite two years, and folk are sitting about the house twiddling their thumbs. So it's good that folk are actual gone out and stuff. I guess is classic. Like just talk shite, talk about football, talk about music. It's what people like to see in it. No. Um, here, so like, well, here, here actually, no, see, because you can't see it. Here, is what I meant to say. Well, well, here and see it because I put it both on YouTube and Spotify, so you will see your mug, man. <laughs> shameless plug, oh, there, fuck right? shameless plug. <laughs> a wee shameless plug, mate. I was professional and I'm looking decent, so it's good that we're on YouTube and all. I must say, yeah, your hair's looking dapper, very well, mate. Class, if I've been 36, mate, I'm fucking clinging on to it. Yeah. Like, I'm happy with that. 36, man. No danger. Outrageous. Outrageous, eh? Then I look at No age lines or nothing, eh? <laughs> it's because I've done fucking nothing in my whole entire life. <laughs> <laughs> easy paper round. Nah, easy paper <laughs> round. But just fucking kicking off, man, your livy born and bred. Um, Where did you originally come from? Ketoy, mate. K-Toy born and bred. Nah, that's Nightridge, mate. Nightridge, no living stuff. We're going to skip over this part. Mate. No, no, no. no. <laughs> K-Toy's a mate. huge part of Liam growing up. Nightridge is just... Oh, yeah, it's some, see, now that I've got kids, right, and I live in, like, a, a nice area, right, where the only drama is if you didn't take your bins out. And <laughs> I actually, there's a big part of me that I like that. I like, like... I take a bit of pride in myself when I look at where I live and see the kids and think, fuck, I've done all right for myself, be a wee boy for Nightridge. I did always tried my best in life not to become, not just to plug Begbies, but a pure Nightridge cliche, like just a pure bam, didn't achieve nothing, blamed where he grew up and blamed his surroundings for him never achieving anything in life. But there's a huge part of me too when I look at the girls and I think, Nightridge made me, man. Like, yeah. it, it just, oh, like it did. Brilliant. It was just a pure, it was a great place, it was a terrible place, it was a scary place, it was a fun place, but like, I couldn't tell you my neighbours name. Eh? I've got two neighbours, I've lived here for 10 years, I don't know who they are. I say all right mm. to them because I'm polite and I see them, but I couldn't tell you anything about them. I think back to growing up with all the folk that I know, still every one of them, pretty much still my best pal, talk to them every day. We, if I came home from school, my man and I were in, dive into my next door neighbours, I'd have my dinner there, chat with my, chat my own daughter, say, hey, by the way, I'm just going to stay here, and like, my man that'd be like, oh, you've been here this whole time, I'd be like, I've been next door, and it was just, like, you look at that stuff, you'd look out for each other, everybody knew who everybody was, and don't get me wrong, like, well, I was a wee wanker when I was a kid, we'd cause mayhem or whatever, <laughs> but it was that weird way where it was like, you had that weird respect for each other. Like, you would, oh, I didn't do anything to that house because that's Corbett's such house. And such. Didn't, I didn't do that because he's sound and all that. And it was just a brilliant place to grow up. Taught you so many life lessons. And I think a big part of growing up now, that's that's all missing. Do you know what I mean? It's all, it's all missing for, like, everybody, for we guys, to, to older folk, that sense of community and looking out for each other and that. It's just, it's just not the same anymore. No, I think me and Paul can echo that because we grew up in Ladywelly, so right over the bridge. Aye, but they were like... Attention. <laughs> aye, aye. But, aye, but even, even then, mate, I remember, like, I, I love Nitrogen. and you get wrap, wrapped up in your wee worlds and all that sort of stuff, and yeah. I remember awesome. being like, oh, you're not supposed to go over to Ladywell, or if you do, you'll get battered and that. And I think, but it's like, who, fuck, who fucking cared, man? Like, who was watching that bridge? Do you know what I mean? Like, Guard duty uh, or something like we boys being like, right, you, you sit up, you sit up at Ladywell Bridge, and if anybody from Nightridge comes over, mate, sound sound the alarm and we'll fucking battle them. You think to yourself, but that's how we used to live. Uh, and no, see, right. see, see, as I grew up, to, that's when I started to like, when I got to like 16, 17, 18, 19, working, gone out, starting to see a wee bit more of the world, and that I started to be like, 
there's still people like that, man. Still f- at 20, 21, 22, I can't go to Lady Well, mate. How? I'll get battled. What are you talking about, mate? It's not the Sopranos. Do you know what I mean? Uh, no diggies a shit, mate. Or you'd go to Club Earth and like... It's more like Budden Lawn, mate. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you Budden's... can remember what, what Club Earth used to be like because it was that mad fucking hexagon shape thing is you used to go uh, in it. Every bit of Livingston stood in its own wee corner. Um, you'd go uh, in it. No, go in no. and say all right to the folk for an and then you'd walk and you'd say all right to the boys for Lady Well and then you'd walk around and say all right to the guys for Craig's Hill and then Deadridge and that. Like you'd go back to Nightridge. Aye. Like, and, like but, <laughs> but you would meet you'd meet the boys whose heads were pure fried through all that nonsense that would never go but I can't go I can't go to the top bar at Club Earth because that's where Craig's Hill is. And I'm like oh, I, I can assure you nobody up there cares. <laughs> it's a uh, Saturday night everybody's mad with it man. Enjoy your night. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like nobody, nobody cares. Uh, it's like, it's been the last the last time I seen the Begbies and the Harvey, right? I was sitting next to like Billy Beveridge and all that, like so oi Lady Bell, oi Night like, It was just one big, okay, it was one big party in there till the end. Aye, and that's, <laughs> aye, aye, totally then the aye, drink okay. and the aggression for the alcohol would take over and everything else. But it's, it's funny though because it's you think how did they, those stories come from like dads and brothers and uncles and all that that maybe mm. moved to Nightridge in the 70s and mm. still live in that like go out to Glasgow because that's what Livingston is it was a Glasgow yeah, first, but one it was built to help yeah. for all that and you think all the families that came through here and brung like all the dramas for Glasgow to Nightridge and I think still living them in 2000. <laughs> you mean, no, no. honestly, man, nobody cares. Absolutely, nobody no. cares. But it was great, though. Like, I like Livingston as a place as well. Like, uh, it was a shite hole, but each wee shite hole was so proud of its wee shite hole. Do you know what I mean? Like, you meet somebody for Lady Well, they loved being for Lady Well, met somebody for Nightridge, <laughs> loved being for Nightridge, somebody for Dean's <laughs> loved it. Like, do you know what I mean? And it was, uh, when you look at where it is, you think there's nothing to love, but it's brilliant it's the people that make the people that make those towns and look at where we've got to cause it I would never be anywhere in life if it wasn't for, for nitrogen growing up nitrogen that exactly it's uh, funny you say that Corbett like there's that page on Facebook the, the wonderful world of Facebook growing up in Livingston and there were right. old photos that are back from the 70s and the 80s and the kind of off colour photos that people have scanned out their computers and you're like I recognise that Steve. that has literally not changed a bit Except for the burnt out house and the burnt out car and the, the, the upside down trolley <laughs> that's sliding down the path, you know. Aye. But, uh, aye. It's, Livingston had character, and I think aye. now with the modern society, it's kind of drained away, as you say, about a kind of community, kind of vibe. Aye, I mean, it's like we even seen it where we were, when we were in Nightridge or whatever, like we started to see, like, when I started to get to a wee bit older, like, like 13, 14, 15, I went to high school. I started to realise that I was a hell of a lot more fortunate than people for Nightridge because my mum and dad were what would be classed as well off. We owned a house, it wasn't a council mm-hmm. house. And it wasn't until you started to, like, your neighbours that had been there for 10, 15, 20 years were getting moved out with the council because, you know, their, their kids had maybe got past the age of 16. So the council needed a, a four bedroom house and shipped them out or a couple of the houses on my street turned into like homeless shelters or emergency housing for for all that. And then that's when you started to notice the pure difference in the community. Like it just started, as soon as it started to become disjointed, it was, you started to lose that sense of like community spirit and all that that we had before, if you know what I mean? Because we have it here like that. My wife didn't grow up and actually she went back or whatever and she's constantly like, Lock the door, lock the door, lock the back door, lock the side door. And I'm like, I don't think I can even lock my door like Richmond. Like, I can't even remember if I even had a front door key. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, no, literally, it was never that. It was a dodgy place, Nightridge. It could be dead scary, but it was never like that. Like, 20 years of living in Nightridge, house was never robbed, never broke into, car was never robbed, never broke into. I think the craziest they got one time was somebody stole a, a broken lawnmower for the side of their house that was for the dump anyway. I remember my dad chasing him being like you forgot the fucking cable you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saving me a, a favour thank you very much uh, take a fucking cable mate take the cable take a fiver <laughs> 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 it was some place like nah, and even like we walked through Lady World Nitrous not that long ago and we're just looking at it going this isn't the same man like uh, 
you look at like I know the people in Nightridge it, it probably it's a great convenience to them they're loving like the Aldi or the Lidl or whatever it is at the top mm. of at the top of Nightridge and that now but yeah. when you actually look at the impact inside Nightridge like I think the post office just shut now the Harvey's mm. gone the Chippy's gone yeah the Chinese that's been there uh, for years and years and years and years I don't even know if that's still there you've got Javid you've got what uh, you've got uh, you've got Javid you've got Wiley's I don't even know if they're, they're still there eh? and that was like that's what I laugh at about here is I stay in a, a brand new street or a, a estate or whatever you want to call it and it doesn't have a shop you have to go to mm-hmm. Tesco and I used to think back to like I could go down to Wiley's with a note for my ma and get anything I wanted and think of the world that we live in now imagine walking into Tesco with a note for your ma to say give me 20 fags or whatever and I'll pay you a five or the more like in Wiley oh, like Wiley would do it go down and say I need 20 quid and a power card can I can I tap you and pay you tomorrow? You're doing the eight year old with a note for your man. There you go, mate. <laughs> and he's like, aye, sound. But you didn't get that. Uh, like, you would never get the, that. It's the same in Ladywell that like, I'm a do. He was the same. And it was can that sense of community all will look after they'll look after our aim. Or the Alice as it was when I was younger anyway. Uh now Alice or was uh, 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 yeah. But like you used to anymore. But things to like they never it sounds really stupid to say and it's not something to be <laughs> proud of or whatever, but you say like those places never got like turned over or that like shops like in a crazy place like Nightridge where it can be free food bams and, and nutters or whatever, like I don't get me wrong, people would steal crisps or whatever and <laughs> all that, but you never heard stories of like anybody robbing the place or try to dip the till or battering Wally or anything like that, because he was like part of the community everybody mm-hmm. came who he was and he knew who you were and all that and he looked aye. looked after you and looked after the families and that aye definitely mm-hmm. we'll look for a for you gone up to would have been Dean's eh? aye so I went to Nightridge Primary School and I went to Dean's High School so Dean's was mentally eh? it was aye. a crazy 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 school like don't get me wrong it, it's obviously much better now and Mm-hmm. I was Lovely. a generation I, I was a generation of, I felt like like school and all that wasn't it about learning do you know what I mean it was it was dead weird when I think of what we used to get up to and things that used to happen and what teachers used to do and say and, and obviously it's my my memories of it so teachers probably have different outlook in it but I, I remember my first day of school so I missed remember you used to do a two day visit or something when you were in primary seven hi um I missed that because I got to go on holiday, right? And that was another thing that was weird about nights, which is like, I, think I was the only person I knew that had ever been abroad. Like, we used to go on ho- abroad every year on holiday. So we went to Portugal or something like that for the last, and I missed the two-day visit, but I also missed the first two weeks of high school. And I remember my last day of primary school getting, like, gone up for seven in the morning, primary sevens with primary sixes at football, taking my football, taking my football boots, taking my shoot matchbox, uh, lunchbox and all that, and <laughs> loving it. And then I remember my my first day of high school, waiting, like, the night before, get my bag ready, get my pencil case, get the football, get my shoot magazines in my bag and all that. And then my mates came in for me in, in the morning. I'm there with my wee pack lunch, and they were like, oh, we didn't take a bag to school. We didn't wear jackets. We go to the top shop and buy a half bottle of Buckfast and we drink it on the way to school and we smoke. And I was like, what the fuck's <laughs> happened? I've only been away for two weeks. <laughs> you know, it's funny, That's people watching this from outside Livingston wouldn't understand it. That's pretty damn close to the truth. So <laughs> I was like, I I'm now a wee fanny. Like I went for the last day at primary school. I was quite, I was quite cool. But like me now, I'm a wee gift with my bag and my jacket. And these boys were smoking fags and we were fighting St. Maggie's and try to fucking winch birds and get shagging and that. And I was like, I'm only 12, man. I don't know what, I don't I'm know only what a wee guy. <laughs> I am only a wee boy, man. What am I supposed to do? And that was like first day, genuinely. <clears throat> what can you do? Can you remember what Dean's used to be like? Can you remember uh, what it was? The old Dean's. Ah, yeah, Dean's. The old Dean's are. So you come in and you could go that way to the like cafe side if you were like got the swimming or the football or whatever and you'd go That's up to the, the main wow. main double doors <laughs> uh, and you'd come in the double doors and then turn right into the like the main hall where like the cafeteria was and that and it's like fucking rammed packed all different years and all that walked in with my mates walked through the door went to try and find a table and somebody threw somebody through a window 
And I was like, what the fuck, man? It's just the first day. <laughs> I was like, first day. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck? It's like leaving primary school into the Matrix. Aye, <laughs> right, it, was, it was crazy, mate. And I, I'm no joking, I remember it. It was first morning break, right? I'll know name or names in case she's listening and it gets embarrassed. But someday in second year, our pal came up to me and said, whatever her name was, wants to shag you, right? And I was like, all right. And they were like, they were like will you shag her? And I was like, no. And, and then she went, she went away and then she came back at lunchtime. She was like, I'm just here to tell you that the such and such lassie, she's going to batter you after school. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> was like, tell her, I'll shag her. Tell her, I'll shag her. I'll shag her, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. But I was like, what a first day, man. Battered off a bird, with me shag her, and somebody got through through a window. <laughs> That's the title, Auntie, you know that. That's the title. That's the title. Ooh. But even then, that was like, like I said about like school and no really being about being in school. I remember, and yours will probably be the same. Like, my mum and dad like did really well for themselves in life, and you know, I come from like a good background in terms of having been financially stable and having stuff and all that. My dad's got university degrees and all that, and he'd always been like, "What you picking for your?" your classes and all that for third and fourth year, then what you got to do for your hires and where do you want to go to university, do you want to go to art school, all that type of stuff. And I remember being, having those conversations and kind of being like, ah, this is important, like I, this this feels important, but I can remember talking to my mates that weren't in a similar situation and they were being like, I didn't know and I, my mum and dad didn't care or my mum doesn't care if they were like single parents and all that and like, after like end of fourth year, it was like everybody just left, and I can remember looking back on it now, thinking, "Fucking hell, man! Imagine leaving school at like fifteen or sixteen. I didn't have a clue. You know, I still don't know. I still don't have a clue now. And then I look <laughs> at where those where those people are now, and I think, you know, majority of them will still be living in and about Nightridge or in and about with their, their mas or whatever it is, and working like you know, like." factory jobs or like just the bouncing for like paycheck to paycheck and I think that's where I felt like school pure let you down like if you are I was too even me as somebody semi-sensible and done all right for myself even at a time I think I was too young for school eh? like not for school but for like learning and making decisions about I don't know if I wanted to be a fucking that architect I had to like do you want to be an architect when you're 13 I don't fucking know I know I don't know what I'm going yeah. to do tomorrow like, do you know what I mean? And then it's like that pressure of being like, you've got to, you've got to do good at exams and that. And I, I say it to this day now. It's like the people that I know that were like the smartest folk in school, they're at the same level as us. All they were good at was answering questions. They didn't yeah. actually pick up any knowledge or learn anything. They just knew how to answer questions and quizzes, and they got to go to better classes and get better teachers and all that. And everybody that was like in the middle that was struggling or wasn't interested in fucking learning about Pythagoras kind of got just left behind if you know what I mean and mm-hmm. I find that weird school seems totally different now like it feels like you know there is proper like structure in, in yeah. schools if you know what I mean because you'll all be in the same you'll all be in there make a joke or something in class and you get fucked up you get fucked uh, up twice you get put in a disciplinary card like you're some bad bad egg because you're 15 year old and you were, I, but like, <laughs> think about it, man. Nah, you're, you're like a 15 year old wee boy. Do you know what I mean? Like, what do you expect? It's the same now. I've, I've got two wee girls, one of them's just started school, and it's like she's only five. And they're like, oh, they should, she doesn't eat her lunch, but nobody checks on her. They didn't help her go to the toilet. They didn't tie her shoelaces. Now, like, she's fucking five, mate. She's a baby. Like, do you know what I mean? And at 15, it's like, what did you, what did you kick? Liam out of class for, or because he wasn't listening and he was cracking jokes. Like, what you, he's fifteen. He's a daft wee laddie. What, like, what, what, what else? That's surely if you were to describe what being a teacher is and what you expected from a class with fifteen-year-olds, so you're going to get people that are just going to be having a laugh and try to be funny. That's like, surely that's fucking part of the course. But you get kicked out. You get put on a disciplinary card get knocked down a class, like, I don't know, at the Tuesday General and Foundations uh, and Hiles uh, and that. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Uh, it was like, 
you fucking fail one test and it's like get your mark you're getting chucked into the fucking foundry class or whatever and all the stigma that comes with with all that and you think wait a minute how am I getting punished for all this day like what surely something should happen with the teachers do you know what I mean if 30% of a teacher's class end up getting out and put down to a, a lower class surely that reflects better than a teacher or not not just the kids really Oh, definitely a span on the works then to just intermediates. <laughs> Aye, again. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I mean, it was mental, mate. But that was like what we did is it was like every you all have it to say you got you either got slagged if you were in Foundy Math or Foundy English or whatever. And yeah, like, that's mental, mate. Like <clears> that's <throat> mad to get pure punished because you might not be fucking good at learning about Shakespeare. Fuck's that got to do in my life? I don't know. I don't know anything about Shakespeare now. In a lot of classes, like, for example, PE, and uh, to some extent, maths, I was horrendous at maths in school. So I ended up going for credit fast track, which is, like, apparently doing, like, your prelims and, like, second years. That's what I've done. And then as I went through the year, because I ended up being in an all-boys class, so basically just all mates, so I went for, like, 100% focus, they just... Absolutely no focus and flinging rubbers at the teacher. Yeah, yeah but that's come the end of the year. So that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing, isn't it? It wasn't just grown up, though, wasn't it? It was. It was just I just. It was off of the pattern. <laughs> it's just it's grown up, but it was like you think I think uh, the stuff that. Well, it's hard to talk about now before it sounds like a pure nutter because I'm. You're not saying that like I didn't want anybody to get bullied, and it's no bullying that I'm talking about. But like that gentle ribbon, that sort of. No camaraderie, but like, I like it was, and it, and I'm not saying that folk should go and get bullied. No, that's fucking stupid. That's not what I mean. But like, I would never have went to my school dressed as a Pokemon, right? I, I just it <laughs> wouldn't have happened, mate. You'd have been fucking destroyed. <laughs> but I, I've Aye. been. Oh, no, I've, you need a camera immediately. I I've been thirty year old and interviewed somebody that showed up dressed as a Pokemon, and I'm like, what's happened, mate? You're twenty five year old. Well, did you know have a mum or a dad or a pal or somebody that could say you like Pokemon sound, mate? But fucking come on, like do you know what I mean? You're no, you're no setting yourself up for life here. <laughs> Dress, uh, kicking about dressing like a Pokemon, and that's what I look back as is all the stuff that used to get in trouble. Or you think that's surely that's what being a wee boy was about, man? Like mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? That's it's just being crazy. a wee funny in class and just causing mayhem. Aye, fucking class through birds, you're gone through puberty you're fucking learning you're coming to fucking like sexual maturity and birds are talking about about you and you're talking about them and you're trying to fucking be an adult and you're yeah. trying to deal with all this stuff about like drinking or smoking and fighting and your football team and what bands you like and all that like, you're trying to identify who you actually are do you know what I mean yeah. and then you've got fucking some mad guy asking you if you want to be a fucking scientist mm. <laughs> I don't know man like, I don't know I just want to get Gary Locke to play with hearts, man. That's what I care about. <laughs> it's like, I was the same in school. I didn't have a fucking scooby. Right? But I'm back at college now and I can exactly what I want to do. Can exactly where I'm going now. But it doesn't give you the life skills, honestly. School doesn't give you the life skills at all. It will, aye, it doesn't give you the life <clears> skills that you need. It teaches you things, like you said, that it does a bit of character building depending on where you went to and I'd like I'm so thankful to being in those situations because I was wise to the world when you came mm-hmm. out. Like my wife, for example, is very academic. She's got a master's degree. She's an actuary. She's like does she's outrageous, right? But she doesn't have a fucking clue about how the world works, man. Like she doesn't know things. She's just got no common sense. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I think I've I've been there. I've been like exposed and it's not I'm saying it's a good thing to be this but it teaches you to wise up and it, at least know what you're doing but you know I've been exposed to, to drugs for a young age for like my mate smoking weed or mm. taking eckies and drinking for 13, 14 year old and getting involved with birds and I've seen boys get birds pregnant at 15 and think fucking hell man I'm not doing that like do you know what I mean and it set you up for set you up for life and then all the like folk that went to fancy schools and were like hidden and had to be well behaved man you'd see them on a Friday or a Saturday up Decky Hill after fucking half a bottle of Buckfast or MD man and they were fucking oh, wild no. <laughs> <laughs> they were wild in they were... the fucking hill <laughs> aye and you're like Jesus man what's going on bye school was weird I I still think like um, I'd you can read the Martin is probably if I seen him or something right? 
um, he talks about school like sort of the same way it wasn't about learning or that like it's pretty similar um, but getting on to yourself Liam going to go right into your passion with hearts what's your you go. growing up being a hearts fan again what's your Aye. first sort of memories growing up to be about 98 well I've been a uh, dead lucky in my life and you know that through contacts in football I've been able to peek behind the curtain at certain aspects of football that other people didn't get to see and that started for like a pure young age so my cousin Scott and my cousin Stephen my cousin Scott played schoolboys with Rangers played with Scott and schoolboys played with Rangers and goals right up until he was 16 then signed professionally in Newcastle so I feel like I was maybe like Seven, eight, nine, ten. My cousin was playing with Newcastle at the height of like Kevin Keegan and Shearer and Janola and all oh. that sort of stuff. So we get to go oh. to Newcastle. I uh, got to go to the training ground, got to meet the players, got to see the players. All my primary school forties are like every boy in my class has got a Newcastle coat because <laughs> it was like hand me downs for my cousin and all that sort of stuff. But his brother Scott at the time he was good at football and he got to an age where he played had an opportunity to, to go professional and but he played with hearts up that age up those age groups so my first memories are being like my dad is why I'm a hearts fan like my dad moved to Glasgow to Edinburgh when he was young and we used to go mm-hmm. Easter Road Saturday Tyne Castle Saturday just home and just when whoever was at home would go until he was old enough to decide what team he wanted and supported mm-hmm. hearts so then that's why I support hearts but so when my cousin was with Hearts and training and stuff. We used to get to go to Tidecastle. I get pictures of me hitting penalties into Henry Smith or sitting with like Gary McKay or John Robertson and all that sort of stuff. So, for a pure young age, I just remember being obsessed with Hearts, but obsessed with football. Too. Like my mum and dad always tell that fun, like funny stories. He'd been like, it wasn't red. That was another colour. That was Aberdeen, Green, Celtic, Blues, Rangers. Maroon's hearts, do you know what I mean? Like you just that's how I how I did it. My dad I always tell the funny story of being like it was a nursery and we had a like substitute teacher or something we did the register and I never said there was an Elium Corbett there and the wee woman was like, What's your name, son? And I was like Henry Smith. And they were like panicking, being like, oh, God, fucking got up your fucking random kid. Got up your random kid here and somebody's missing. So the, when they phoned my mum and dad or they phoned the teacher or whoever, they'd be like, here, we are a kid missing. They're like, you got a Henry Smith? I'm like, well, that's Liam. <laughs> that's Liam. That's fucking but, brilliant. But I, again, it's that thing for like, and you will get it as well because I know none of us support Celtic or Rangers here, but yeah. it became very apparent to me from a very young age because I got to go to Hearts games that I used to be like, and I still carry it now. Like, I'm a supporter. Like I go everywhere with Hearts, and usually the same with Levy and, and Hibs. And that's Maybe different for being a <laughs> that's different for being a fan. And Nightridge was filled with Rangers and Celtic fans that couldn't mm-hmm. point on the map to where I brought was or Celtic Park was. And there's look, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's it's expensive to get to those things, but it, it became pretty clear pretty pretty young that my dad would take us wherever hearts were. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, we took us to, like, I was born in 1985, and obviously, you know what happened in 1986, but this that season started in 1985, and as, as soon as hearts went on that unbeaten run, and it looked like we were going to do something special, I was at every game, because mm-hmm. my dad was like, he's got to, like, if we win the league or win the cup double or whatever, he's got to be there. Like, he's got to be there, so... I didn't have like a first memory of being like, oh, that was my first Hearts game or whatever. I just, it's that thing that it's like, fuck, it's like riding a bike. It's been there. It's been there. I, I couldn't tell you when it happened, how it happened, but I just I tell you, I've never, been able to, I've never been able to fucking shake yeah. it, man. <laughs> I've like never been able to get rid of it. Our clubs are drugs, eh? They're oh, our drugs. Sense. Like, yeah. <clears throat> like for instance... Mark Boyle go. left today and I was, mate, I'm still heartbroken. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, like, it's like you're saying, old firm fans didn't get attached to their players the way we do. Yeah, like, yeah. usually, like, Scatchel and Ken, the likes of yeah. Jamie Walker coming through and all that. Like, it's so in there for us. But it's because, <clears throat> it's like you say, it's like, when we get beat, 
I, I even grown up, I remember it like so. I remember '96 cup final before '98. So I remember being at a couple of Airdrie semi finals really young and getting beat by Airdrie in the semi final and can sense like the pure disappointment, but could see like it was all about like the day out. And I hate that mentality now, right? No, I don't hate it, but there's a time and a place for all that sort of stuff. But at that time, my hearts and You've probably seen it for the side with Hibs because obviously we're not trying to fucking dig you up or rip you. Oh, you've, you've, had, you've, you've had your moment in the sun and know what it's like to win it. Now. But before that, we used to like, I always hear Hearts and Hibs just celebrated. It's a bit like why I can't get into Scotland, right? It's this whole like celebrating failure culture as if like it didn't matter. We just went for the, the big day out and it's like, I, I get it. But at some point, it's got to matter because you can't just keep missing opportunities all the time because. That's why Celtic and Rangers are so far ahead of everybody else. Do you know what I mean? Like, you look at last year, St. Johnston won a League, a league Cup and Scottish Cup double. Oh, <laughs> last team, uh, The last team to do it was Aberdeen. And you think, mm. how have Hearts and Hibs not fucking done that? How have we not been anywhere near that? Hearts have not won that trophy in 60-something years. That's embarrassing, man. Between Hearts and Hibs, between the Scottish Cup and the League Cup, we're nearly 200 years with no fucking winning those trophies between us that's embarrassing that's embarrassing and that's what used to pure wind me up about fans of Celtic Rangers when I was younger is I'd been there and felt the fucking lows and the highs and I feel like that gave me an entitlement to be like shut up to the folk that sat and watched it in the house or seen it on teletext or read it in the paper the next day you'd be like you don't fucking understand what it's like to be sitting in that stand watching your team get fucking beat by Airdrie I mean, yeah. it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Corbett, you might need to explain to the viewers who are of a certain age what teletext is. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> it was not Google. <laughs> aye, it was not Google, that's true. But I hearts have just always been like a pure, the one true constant in my life, eh? being, being hearts. And it's like a thing you spend most of your time hating them. But when you get the odd flashes of joy, it just makes you fucking. That's like a drug, like you said. You just want it again, man. You just, you just need it. You just want. And then you said, as, as you get older, too, you've just had it with Martin Boyle. You start to like have players that you just want to do good for the club because you think they fucking mm-hmm. like they deserve it. I mean, when I think you like Scottish Cup winning players with hearts, and you look through the list of folk that are would be classed as heroes, and then you look at the fact that. Gary Mackay and John Cahoon and Henry Smith and Sandy Clark and all these unbelievable players that built hearts and took us for the brink didn't have any of those mm-hmm. medals uh, fucking Jamie Hamill does or Medi Tile and I think what the fuck how's that for do you know what I mean it's, it's the same with me like Ryardon O'Connor Scott yeah. Brown Kevin Thompson none of them have got a, well in fact sorry Kevin Thompson has like, yeah they've got league, but, league cup medals out I think Tomo got one in 2016, but he never played in the final, oh, yeah. but he was there. But it's the same thing, like, I think it's a travesty. Like, O'Connor and Murder haven't they got it? It's the same, like, you, you've, you probably haven't spent any time thinking about it, but the 98 cup final when Hearts won it, like, the biggest disappointment, if you could pick a disappointment of that whole day, was the fact that when the, full, no, when the full-time whistle blew, Robbo was on the touchline waiting to get subbed on. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think the, the stature that guy's got, the impact he had on Hearts, and he's... He, he, now, he, he, he does have, he does have a, a cut winner's medal, but he never got on the park. And I know that, tell you think, what difference does it make, whether you're standing on the side, you were there, you were involved, but to be on the park and say that you played and Hearts won the, the cup would have been a massive thing for him, if you know what I mean. Yeah, not oh, just for him, but even his supporters, you know. Oh, for him, he's got a bar. <laughs> Robertson's bar, Robbo's... And that thing he says, aye, it's not any more. He's fucking a funeral director or something now. But, uh, aye. and again, that just shows you like what it's like. And I know South Rangers fans love their heroes and all that stuff, too. And I get it. But, like, the impact that one person can have, like, look at last season, was it? When Hearts played Cali Thistle, but it was behind closed doors, but fucking sold 11,000 tickets because Robbo asked us to. Robbo mm-hmm. said Hearts fans buy tickets and we did do you know what I mean because that's just one guy We would that wouldn't have happened for anybody else other mm-hmm. than John Robertson do you know what I mean and then it, it was coupled with the fact that he had the sort of tragic stuff with his sister and all that that was happening last year and had to take a leave for the game or whatever but that's what bugs me when you see guys like like John Souter 
like, I get it. I totally understand it. You know, I get to see what it's like to play with Rangers. I know how big an impact that'll have on his life and his family's life. But you think he like he'll just be a face in the door at Ibrox. He'll maybe stay for a couple of seasons. He might win a few trophies, but he'll leave and he'll get a clap once or twice if he comes back at half time. But that'll be it. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, if he'd even achieved anything at the Hearts, that sort of back for the brink story where his career was almost ended and then he's, he's came back and led us to Europe or won a Scottish Cup or something like that. I say it to Scotty all the time because obviously he plays football and I was like, I, I was worried that his club was Burnley like because you get one one player that just resonates with a club and does brilliant with them. Everything goes well. Mm-hmm. Fans love them. Performances go up. We had it with Paul Hartley. We had it with Rudy Scatcho. And I thought like Scott might have had that way. We're Burnley, but it seems to have had seems to be have that way with Angels and that as well. And that's what you like. John Souter had that with Hearts, and to just to kind of walk away from it in the manner that he has is fucking massively disappointing. Like, no, I, I, I can't what you mean. That they like see if Nisbet went to Celtic last January. It'd just yeah. be another face in the door. You know what I mean? It's. Some of the players could style and be legends, eh? No, he's just another shite face in your door that can't score. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. You can out here. I just remember last year when you beat us in the Scottish Cup, I was sitting with my missus, scranning on Andor's, right? As you beat us in the Cup, and it's your videos. Okay, you're just like... Hey. And she said, uh, like, who is this guy? And I was like, oh, he's... Listen, he's a one wanker. of the few Hearts fans. No, no, I was like, he's a wanker, but get what? He takes a stick off me and I'll take it off him happily. Aye, and that's, well, that's another thing that I like about uh, it. And people get this mixed up when you talk about it because yeah. they think it diminishes the rivalry or whatever. Believe me, Hearts and Ibs hate each other. Come to East mm-hmm. Road on the 2nd of January or February or whenever it is and see how much Polis is there how much we've got to be separated from each other and all that sort of stuff. But it is like that. Like, do you know what I mean? I'll, if you said, do you want to dive in the car through, dive in the car through you, that gets me up in the train, we'll meet up. A neutral, <laughs> neutral pub. You go doing that way, I go doing that way. I'll see you after the game type thing. Like it's... 100%. I don't hate you because you're a Hibs fan. I don't hate you because of what school you went to or what supposed pretend God you believe in. Do you know what I mean? I, I hate you because I like to be better than you. You're a rival. But, you're still a boy, <laughs> like you're still uh, a person. Your football team doesn't fucking make you. You got to hand uh, it. Same with the podcast. Eh? I know we'll probably talk about the podcast, but it was like uh, I always try my best to like I'll hand take it out or whatever, but take it back if somebody wants to get it back. Like it's you've got to take the rough with this move, haven't you? Hundred nice. percent. And just even I was scrolling for your podcast Twitter. You retweet all the other hearts Twitter uh, podcasts. Eh? Well, I said I've been. We've been, dead lucky. we've been dead lucky where where we've been that folk have took to us and took to the podcast and wherever we can help or whatever we do it. I was like I was like that and when I was in the band in that day is everybody it's hard enough, man. It's hard enough to make a difference, it's hard enough to make an impact for everybody pure turning on each other and try to be one up each other, or we fucking sold twenty five tickets more than you, and that. It's like, well, we're still in the same place, we're still doing still the same, the same stuff. And, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, what difference does it make, man? And it's the same with the podcast as well. Like, I, anything that I've been involved with through the podcast, I've made sure. Like, so I, I've wrote a article thing for the program for uh, Tuesday for the Celtic game, but I've roped in and thing we'd like four other podcasts to be like. And then he just come to me every week for a story like there's a guy for the podcast here or here's this guy or here's that guy so that everybody gets a shot at it, do you know what I mean? Oh, that's class. I guess the, I guess the same with the Hibs boys. <clears throat> I'm pals with boys on strong opinion Hibs and it does its share and share alike. <laughs> and it's but, like you've said there, it's, I've had, we've had Hibs talk, we've had Stephen Renner on, on the podcast because I've done the same with you. It's like I always tell that funny story, it was Ollie Lee or something scored the screamer or I don't know if it was Aaron Hickey or something but if you could have sat on the train on the way home as a Hibs fan and thought the fucking last person I want to see walk through that fucking carriage door 
it's fucking Liam Corbett. And that's what happened. Opened the door and I was like, yes! I was like, what's happening? What's happening? It was like, oh, fuck's sake. I knew it was going to be you. I was like, all right, mate. But uh, same, like I said, we've been there fucking plenty of times, seen us get beat or pumped or whatever. It's just what happens. It's football, man. No, you mentioned the band and I fucking love Juice. Fucking love Juice to the day it ended. How did it all start, Corbett? How did it all start with the Begbies? Well, weirdly, as I said, I grew up in Nightridge. We used to have what was called the square route. So all the back gardens faced out into like a bit of concrete. So it was a square bit of concrete with a lamppost in it. But it was like the centre of the universe. So there'd be me, Scotty, his brother, Stuart, Mark Glees, Geddes's. Like there was 10 of us probably that lived in that little street. Played football every day, rounders, football, tennis, tennis, anything. And as we grew up and stuff, we used to be like, I'd mum, my dad, and his family for night, like for Livingston or whatever, were like big in uh, music and were a part of like the Levy Punk scene, they were in mm-hmm. the Levy Punks and all that sort of stuff. So, like, all my aunties had like boyfriends at the time, like Ziggy and Bongo and all these guys that were like started the Levy Punk movement and Hendo and all that sort of stuff. So I'd always been involved in music for like a wee boy's age. I remember show and tell at school, primary two or three or something. I took never mind the bollocks for the Sex Pistols because that was my that was my pride. That was my pride and joy. I remember if my ma if my dad was working, my ma was doing that annoying thing on a Saturday, doing fucking hoovering and polishing, and that would have like BG's on, Celine Dion, fucking REM or something like my tunes that she'd be polishing away to and I'd be like fucking singing along and doing it all that and then yeah. if it was my ma that was at work, my dad was doing that we'd have The Jam, The Clash, The Sex Pistols, fucking The Specials anything like that. My next door neighbour was heavy into like Britpop so I remember sitting on the edge of his bed I must have been fucking eight or something and he was a grown man and we're sitting on the end of the bed listening to What's the Story of Morning Glory, the album. Yeah, like just yeah. sitting there, just looking at the wall, two years. I don't like Oasis, right? It's, you know that. It's not uh, no, my, no, okay. no my scene. It's not that I don't like them or can I appreciate that they're good. It's just not my scene. Like, do you know what I mean? It was, uh, never, it, was, it was never for me. I was more punk and then through that reggae bluegrass like two-tone and then like American pop punk is like the thing I pure loved the most because it was that stupid style of music that just encapsulated what I felt like as a daft wee teenager that didn't know what I was what I do like you know what I mean if I mm-hmm. fucking I had a girl in her pants and her boobs I'd have probably squeezed them and ran away laughing like you know what I mean and that's what like <laughs> That's what like fucking Blink One Eight Two were like singing about. Uh, like, do you know what I mean? Like scanting, scanting, scanting their mates and running away and making fart, uh, fart jokes. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what that's. But that's what I always like is that is that wee boy, and that's where that's where it came from. So back to the square we used to as we grew up. So Phil, who was there, would have been blasting Oasis, and we'd be playing football or whatever. Or Mark Geddes, and that used to like fucking get high as fucking smoke joints constant so it'd be like Bob Marley and Reggae would be coming out that house and then if it was me and Scotty and that were out in the, pl- the square I'd have fucking Blink-182 blaring or I'll clean through you or Sex Pistols, Libertines or something like that so it was just football music was always what we did Scotty and Stuart moved like I just said there about having to gear up the house and move away so the council made them gear up the house and they moved to Howden and weird as yeah. hell, they moved two doors away from my granny, which is the weirdest thing ever. So I couldn't shake the math. And I'm like, so they'll be what, 33, 34, I'm 36. So I'm two years, two years older than them. So when they would have been like 15, 16, breaking through with Falkirk and Stuart, who was playing with Rafe at the time and all that sort of stuff too, I was got to gigs and seeing bands and got to Barrowlands all the time or up Colburn Street and buying posters and all that type of stuff. My room was covered head to toe in posters and music. I had a drum kit, played my guitar, Same. played all that stuff. And I remember I went to see, I think the last time I'd even heard, spoke to Scott and Stuart about got a, any form of gig or concert. They went to see Blue, right? Oh, <laughs> and I was like, all right, sound. So me, I went to see uh, Baby Shambles at the awesome. SECC and they were supported by The View potentially even the enemy or something like that. I don't know, it was a couple of bands played plus the Baby Shambles, right? And 
I remember leaving out the bit and everybody's oh, 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 and as I got to the door, I seen Scott and Stuart. And I was like, the fuck are you staying here? And they're like, what do you mean? I fucking love the baby shambles. And I was like, what? How? Sergeant might have been on the bill, actually, because we went for about two years of just following Sergeant and the law and the view about Nick anywhere in Scotland. Mm-hmm. So we seen them and that was, I was like, well, you're staying here. And I didn't know he's going to gigs. I'm at gigs all the time. Like, if a wee boy, I'd be, I'd go to, any gig I'd go to Edinburgh by myself or mates or whatever and just go watch music. I remember seeing Kings of Leon at the Badlands as part of the NME tour thing before they were a wee lassie band or whatever. Like they were <laughs> fucking hairy, <laughs> couldn't the see their faces. Aye, uh-huh, like it was, it was brilliant. And for that, I was like, I never knew you came to gigs. So like I would come all the time and we started to talk about music. So then we were like, like, when's the next time the viewer playing? we'll go see the view so we started to go see the view and then through that for supporting bands we started to go see Sergeant all the time and then the law uh, Tango in the Attic fucking Apple Scruff DSS like all those type of bands that, and I became more into because again I don't really like the view it's not, my, it's not my type of music but the bands that were like supporting them were like brilliant and they were just young boys so we started just at, Scotty was like teach me how to play the guitar and I was like, I'll teach you how to play guitar. And then as Brothers Day, Stuart was like, teach me how to play the guitar today. I was like, sound <laughs> yeah. like I'll, whatever. And you know, coming back to the club, I'll get the guitar out, we'll, we'll sit and play or whatever. And I've always been like this right now. So if I was in your house party or whatever right now and said, get a guitar out, I'd be the last person to do the guitar day. Because my music, I would I couldn't play an Oasis tune. I couldn't play anything that anybody will sing along to. But I'll play fucking... Anything of blink on it to anything of alcohol and show any fucking slipknot or something, anything that nobody plays, but I could play my own song. We need to get this party going. We'll start these kind of house parties, right? So I would be like, I'd try to learn those songs and then I'd be like, this is shite. And I'd do my intro, start to play my own song and be like, I didn't like that chord shape or I didn't like that sound, so I'll do my own sound and all that. And through that, when I was like teaching them, we were starting to be like, you want to get a jam we'll get I can play the you just play guitar and I'll play the drums like because I can play the drums today so we got Danny Sim he played the guitar he played the acoustic guitar and we booked it like sound station for an hour and it was the shittest thing ever that's ever (laughs) happened right an acoustic guitar that couldn't get plugged in me on the drums Scotty no actual able to play the guitar and Stuart holding a bass that he didn't know what the fuck to do with (laughs) and uh, but it was like it was like the best hour ever and I was like, well, let's stop trying to learn. You didn't know how to play your instrument, so stop trying to learn songs that have taken Oasis and fucking Blur and all that to, like, the top of the pops and the top, top of the charts and that. Like, you're not, you're not going to learn that. It's too complicated. Why don't we just start doing our own stuff? Like, just start making our own tunes up? And that's what we started to do. Scotty was like, I've been writing songs to, like, lyrics. And I was like, well, I, like, I write lyrics to. So I'll start putting tunes. And so we did an acoustic demo and wrote a couple of songs and got my pal Ross uh, to come and record it uh, acoustically and then we were like fuck we should get a drummer like, we'd, let's like do it properly get a drummer last year I worked with him and I worked in Levi's he used to tell me all the time our, our boyfriend played drums and I was like oh, I'm not sure man because I remember him for like nights out and him coming and he was like a bit of like with like Guns N' Roses t-shirts long hair a bit sleazy and I fucking detest that style of music it's not that I just didn't like it I fucking hate it right? it's shite <laughs> and uh, I was like I don't know I was like I don't I don't know man so but anyway we got, I, I said to her I was like does, does Ross still play the drums does he want to come along and he said he said aye so Ross What's came along and he aye and he was instantly the best musician in a band like he was outrageous like he was such a good drummer knew music, knew how to read music, could teach Stuart bits on the bass. And then we just started to, I think there were like five songs or something like that. I remember the funniest thing ever, right, is Yogi obviously broke him through it at, uh, at, Hib, at Falkirk, right? But he was at Hibs at this point, right? It was a mm-hmm. Saturday night. It was a Saturday night. We were in Scott's wrecked, playing guitar, writing tunes. We, we, we just, I just wrote the riff and hang with to Ashley, right? And Yogi, Yogi Hughes phones Scott and Scott's burst right trying to pretend that he's being all sensible and Yogi's like, 
come to Hibs. I want you to come to Hibs. And I'm going, fucking tell me fuck off, man. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> no day in it. I wanted him to come to Hibs, by the way. And I was he's dying like, on him coming to Hibs. But at this point, you know, when he knew, I think he knew he was going to Huddersfield or whatever. But anyway, we're like that, and he's out in the garden and how then talking to Yogi, talking to Yogi Hughes, and me and Stuart are fucking do 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 and that fucking Stuart's banging the window, like, tell me fuck off, get in here and sing, man, this is brilliant. Get in, and then that's we wrote we wrote Ashley the day that fucking Scotty was saying no chance to Hibs, and I've never been prouder at any moment. Yeah, the big piece. That's not fair. But uh, aye, that's that's where it was. But aye, so we wrote, we just started writing tunes, got Ross involved, and instantly took us for being like just a piss about to actual. We've got some songs, so we wrote five songs like Ross Go on tour about our mate that died, uh, Nightridge cliche about growing up Nightridge and no turning into a cliche ballad, which was about the nutcases that live next to Stuart and the, the high rise flats hang at Lady Will. Uh, mm. Ashley, which is about Stuart's bird, no Ashley's bird, because both Scott and Stuart are now married to Ashley's, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Stuart wrote Ashley for his Ashley. Uh, uh, and then we learned, like, should I stay or should I go by The Clash? White Riot by The Clash, just because the songs that... So I love the Sex Pistols writing Sid Vicious, never knew how to play the bass. Clyde Matlock that wrote all of the fucking tunes for, for the Sex Pistols, but they kicked them out because they said he was a Tory and he was too, he wasn't, he wasn't punk enough because he kept cleaning his feet. So they kicked him out of the band. Uh, I'm a big Sex uh, Pistols fan now. Mate, I'm obsessed with the Sex Pistols. But anyway, uh, so Stuart, I was like, we could play like songs like The Clash and all that sort of stuff because it doesn't really matter what Stuart's doing. Like we could turn this fucking amp off and they were okay. So then we, because we started jamming, folks started coming to practices like at Sound Station and that. Mm-hmm. Like, Bird, and that's how Scotty met his missus. Like she was mucking about with one of the lasses that I used to work with. Uh, started coming into practices and all that sort of stuff. And then through that, we met Ross Coates. Started to get him Coates, who was fucking class. And he's like, You want to play gigs? You can play Harleys. And we're like, I will fucking. Get a gig, we'll play Harley's, it'll be class. So we played, I think it was the first ever gig we played, it was at, it was Halloween, it was at Harley's, and we were like main support to the Shermans or something like that, they were called the Falkirk, right? And obviously Harley's was like 90 tickets or something like that, sold out, like sold every ticket that we had for, for that showed up, we played for about an hour, an hour and a half. The Shermans didn't even play. We just never <laughs> got off the stage to let them play, which was bad crack at the time. But folk were just fucking loving it. We just played five songs on repeat, man. Like, And I was like, what were we doing? Stuart, literally Stuart, when he got there for the sound check, was like to the, the sound engineer guy, am I all right to stand here? And the sound engineer guy was like, where fucking hell should you going to stand? Like, there's a fucking <laughs> stage. What do you mean? So... He just like I remember going over at one point and like turning his bass amp down because when he did that, and I was like, just fucking pretend that you're you're doing it and all that. And we were like, I had five shite songs, and I was doing guitar changes and all that in between songs. Like I was fucking Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I was like, what you doing? <laughs> but that was class. And then they booked us again to play like four weeks later, and again sold all the tickets. But this time it made like the press, so the press had picked up in it, and mm-hmm. we'd booked to play another gig, and Falkirk were like no like you need to decide what you want to do because we were getting like offers to fucking go to soccer AM and go do all this and all that and like now it's the greatest thing that ever happened to us because it would be embarrassing to go mm-hmm. and play those live because we didn't have a fucking clue what we were doing but it was pretty it was pretty cool and then obviously Scott had to leave and that was when the Begbies really started to like grow into something it was like a band because I was like oh let's do it properly like I, I didn't want to be his band I'd rather be we were banned and start to like do what I wanted to do. And then took us a few years to to sort of build up a bit of a reputation and get a few songs and get a few recordings and all that sort of stuff. And then it just went mental for, for ages and consumed my life for like fucking 10 years or something. Because she's played everywhere. It was absolutely mental. Aye. And the thing that like, I don't know if it was like that thing when you've got bitterness towards folk or that. I don't know if the time if like people thought we played them because of Scott 
like, do you know what I mean? Like, but, oh, Scott would get us these venues and that. And it was like, we've played all those things on merit. I've yeah. never, ever, ever, and Stuart's the same and all, all our pals. It's that weird thing where, like, because you've got a pal that's like that and he's in a privileged position, you almost make a, a, a sort of a harder case of no asking them to do stuff for you. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'd rather get a ticket for a, a gig because I could, I go to, I'd, I'd rather play a gig because I go to, I'd rather get a Hearts ticket because I go to, don't get me wrong, it's great to sort you out because he's got me an Edinburgh Derby ticket this week for, uh, for Andy Halliday because we can't get tickets. Mm-hmm. But, and it was the same with that, like we never messaged Scott or whatever to be like, go and put pressure on somebody to put us here or put us there or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that whole like few years where the arse kind of fell out of it after he'd left, let us <coughs> learn, the, learn the craft and actually become like musicians, if you know what I mean. And that, mm-hmm. That really helped us because we would have it would have been a laugh, laughing stock type thing if we'd actual made it anywhere or got opportunity to go record somewhere in that because me and me and Ross could play our instruments but that was it. Like mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Or we had an awkward situation where we had a potential idea of replaced Stuart straight off the bat, if you know what I mean, and that had just been a kick in the teeth. So uh, it was good to, to build it all back up like mm. And you end up was it was Gary Ovens just got on it, wasn't it? There's something before Gary Ovens. No, no, it was Gary. So we went through like the thing I loved the most about us is we just didn't give a fuck and I loved it, man. Like we were professional. We did give a fuck in terms of like we really tried our best to write good songs and get right into it and stuff, but because of my punk background and stuff like I just Put annoying folk and promoters or doing things that you weren't supposed to. I just I loved it. Eh? The first yeah, ever time, right. first time we ever played King Tutsman. Like they, we only played three songs because it was they never. We got the right to a sound sound check, and there was no barrier. And I don't know why, but I thought the very first time I ever wanted to play a crowd like a big gig, I want folk at the barrier like where I used to be, stand <clears> up against a barrier singing along and all that. And I was like, "There's no barrier." And I'm like, "Well." We don't think you'll need it. And I was like, you're going to need a barrier, man. Like, we, we need something there. And they were like, no, you don't. And I was like, right, okay. So it was like, I was in the band, the Thiefs and a couple of other bands. And <laughs> and we and we played, and uh, you'll know for Nightridge, like Nightridge Cliche or whatever, I used to do this like mad, like, do like this pure long intro thing that was a mm-hmm. Lost Campesino. It was like, I stole it off Lost Campesinos. Uh, and by I hadn't even played my first note and there was about 30 folk on the stage <laughs> and I was like I told you and um, then like so we played Night's Ridge Cliche like twice could halfway through the first time and had to stop because they turned the house lights on and were like like get off the stage and we're like sound played Night's Ridge Cliche again then they get to the end lights on fine they were like right we're gonna fucking we're gonna have this if this happens again you were gonna like kick you out and all that sort of stuff and I was like right fine so I was like to them I was like just play White Riot man like just play White Riot because it's got to be a riot and everybody go mental so just I used to do this like nee no nee no nee no hang on the guitar and it was just mad air raid they turned an air raid siren on turned the house lights on fucking security and all that try to kick us out and we got banned for King oh, Cats after, after the first time we ever we ever played it and we used to love things like that like show up with Stuart who knew nothing nothing about music didn't know anything and he'd show up to gigs didn't he have his own microphone didn't he have a guitar didn't he have nothing but he just didn't care and I loved that about me I loved that about me just fully swagger fully arrogance treated it like I'm the fucking entertainer I am the entertainer I'll do what I want and you'll jump to my tune and for a, for a long time that was that was classy but like, and I love Stuart to bits, and me and him, I've got chasing dreams right down there. The side of my thing, that's what we did two wee dicks for Nightridge Man chasing our dream. But there came a point where actually that dream could have came a reality. And there's a point in that where you have to start to dedicate yourself to the craft. You have to learn a little bit of it because we'd be times that we could have been in the studio or whatever, and I've wrote a tune, he's sung it, we've wrote, put our heart and soul into lyrics and all that sort of stuff. and he's in the booth singing it and you know the guy that's recording it's been like you need to get him singing or vocal lessons and he needs to do this or we we started to become limited in what we could do song wise if you know what I mean and it started to become like a bigger picture with Stuart was that 
he wanted to be like, I've always been really, really good at being able to balance everything, right? So my career was my career. That's what gave me the opportunity to buy a house and all that. So I wouldn't show up late or wrecked to my work or miss a day or no show up. I also, <laughs> lo- I also love my wife to bits and knew for the minute that I met her that that was going to be my life. So I didn't stay out for three day benders and I didn't miss like going out for dinner and still back and still managed to balance being a boyfriend and a boss at work and all that sort of stuff. And you could start to see that Stuart couldn't keep up with the bay for them. Like his work life balance yeah. wasn't right, his relationship with Ashley and stuff wasn't wasn't quite right. And he was still trying to be one of the boys and going nights out and got to see Celtic and being in the band. And then I'm saying to him, right, you need to go get singing lessons, man. And it's like, well, when's he going to get a singing lesson? Because he doesn't have fucking time to scratch his arse. And then we had to, we had to move and we started rehearsing in Glasgow because we had a drummer, uh, Tam, that, that lived through in Glasgow. And then it was like, he couldn't he couldn't commute because he was a student and we had to go through so we'd jump in the car and drive through and it was too late at night and he'd started a new job so that's how eventually it was like Stuart had to Stuart took the decision and we were kind of on the same page that it was kind of the right thing to do because the tensions not just in the band and all that day were were getting a were getting to a point where it was time to time to call it quits and he was like look I can't do this and can I juggle it just now so that's when Gary was like, well, we took a couple of days or weeks to decide what we were going to do, but then Gary was like, I'll, I'll, come, and take, I'll come and start singing. So, right. Jeez. Right, so where do we get to? Right, so I'll tell you... Uh, Gary, Oven, big. Gary Ovens. Gary right. So I'll tell you, this, this built up to, this built up to the, the sort of implosion in, in True Begby style, right, which ended up with kind of Gary being the singer. Once we built up a reputation, we started to see the game a bit, right? We started to talk to folk and find out how people were getting more opportunities than what we were or getting to different places or see things like, I always use Dead Sea Soul as a barometer, right? Because they blew my mind the first time I seen them, right? I could not believe how good a band they were when I first saw them. Went mm-hmm. to see them live and was like, this, is, this isn't like... This isn't just a band for Bathgate. This is a fucking band. Like, this is proper. Like, and it, you know me, you know how opinionated I am on things when it comes to stuff like that. And I, 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 <laughs> fan, but, I, but I fancy myself as like, I, I think I know what music is and I think I know what like good bands are and can spot good bands and that. And like, th- there was loads like, we'd play with like Dead Sea Souls and Regal Thiefs and the Ray Summers and. Apple Scruffs and all these like hundreds of these bands right and they were brilliant great musicians and, and wrote good songs and all that but Dead Sea Souls were like outrageously good and their songs were anthems every one of them were like anthems <laughs> so I used to like look at them and think to myself why are the Regal Thieves playing fucking Tea in the Park BBC Introducing or whatever in Dead Sea Souls are they like why are these bands getting to support touring artists and all that and Dead Sea Souls on me. And then you start to so start to ask the questions is to be like, right, well, where are you recording your tunes? Where are, and then you start to realise that like football, everything's a pure spider's web or my cousins, the fucking chief booker at DF concerts and all that, or my dad paid for the stage at fucking Bella Drum. So, mm. you know, we got to open it and all that. And you're like, right, okay. So these guys are getting to where they are because they're they're connected. They know people. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. who's who's coming to Harley's to watch Dead Sea Souls sell it out, have the place bouncing and singing and from after and from like maybe they're not leaving Glasgow. If you're not central Glasgow on Sucker Hall Street or the wee student bars in and around it, you're fucked, mate. No, because no one's coming to watch you. So we started to pick up pretty quick that actually it was a game. You know, you had to record at the right studio use the right guys to film your videos, get the right PR campaign guys to do that, get the right guys to do your merch, all that sort of stuff, and, and start to make your name with them, and then they start spreading it about, being like, oh, we've seen the guy, we've seen all this, right? So at the height of our powers with Stuart, as a singer, we'd get opportunities to, like, day gigs and shows for a, a, a promotions company called Various Artists, right? 
John Dawkins, the boy's name is, he looks after the enemy rather than the maker, Melbourne, all that sort of stuff, right? Mm. Massive. Disco- first discovered the Arctic Monkeys, all that type of crap, right? But everybody for Sheffield, that area tells you they discovered the Arctic Monkeys, right? But <laughs> everybody but that, dog. Uh, <laughs> but that's that's what it did. So they were like, they started to say, right, you have to, we'll give you a support slot, sell X amount of tickets, give you this gig, sell X amount of tickets, right? So we did all that sort of stuff and we were like, right, look, let's stop pissing about now, like, what do we want to do? We've, we've, we've got a single out, we've gone to tour it in Scotland, we want a couple of gigs in England and that. So they were like, right, we'll do a gig swap for you, right? We've got a Manchester band making waves, you bring them up to Scotland, play a venue, they'll be main support, they'll bring you down to Manchester, you'll be main support, all right, fine. So we booked the classic grand, come up, sold it out, Friday night, brilliant. The band were Blossoms, right? Mm-hmm. It was, so Blossoms were coming up to support us in Glasgow. We were going to Manchester to support Blossoms. At this point, Elliot was our drummer. We daddied Elliot, got be- uh, Peyton in on bass and Gary in on guitar just to beef up everything and make it sound fuller and all that sort of stuff. Elliot was training to be a pilot, right? So was at pilot school in Southampton. And he's like, uh, I'll, my flight's at two o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. I'll be back up the road for five o'clock. Don't worry about it. Right, sound cool. Get to Classic Grand where Scotty was up with his pals, brought a couple of guys up for Burnley to see us. It was the first time we've seen us for ages. We've got two fucking double-decker buses for Knightsridge coming to see us. Sold all the tickets out, 500 or whatever it is the venue holds. It's fucking absolute packed. Yeah. Elliot's not there for sound check. Right, sound Boston's can do sound check. Seven o'clock, Elliot's not here. Eight o'clock, Elliot's not here. Nine o'clock, Elliot's not here. And I'm like, where the fuck is Elliot, man? Because we're on it. Ten o'clock. Do you know what I mean? Like, we've got A and R's here. We've got actual record people here to see us. And Elliot, mm. it's, Elliot's plane had been cancelled. Like his flight had been cancelled. And they were like, "Do you want to do an acoustic set?" And you'll know yourself, and it's not slight on Stuart. And he, did, he said it himself, but the type of music that we play. It's no acoustic music. Do you know what I mean? No. It's just no. It's not any good, man. It's all about energy. It's the crowd. It's about all that sort of stuff. So we end up fucking it. Elliot never made it in time, and the Blossoms ended up having to play twice, right? But obviously, the massive disappointment of that was because Scott was there, and it was like Stuart almost felt more disappointed that we didn't get to play for him. So he was like, "Let's arrange to go back to the Harvey, and we'll play a show at the Harvey." And the rest of us in the band are like, mate, what the fuck? We've just literally blown the best opportunity probably we'll ever get. And you want to go back and play at the Harvey where we play fucking every day. We practice in the Harvey. Do you know what I mean? Like, fuck, fuck it. So we were all like annoyed and Stuart was fully bevy and drinking with his brother and all the folk. And that was what was brilliant. It was great at getting in amongst the folk that come to see us and having a bevy and having a laugh and making folk like feel that it was like a stag do or something like that. Do you know what I mean? He was brilliant at that. Showman. But we wanted to play the show and we were massively disappointed in it. Big, massive, like, argument erupted between Stuart and uh, Gary's brother in the Harvey, which ended up fucking Gary and Stuart ended up falling out and all that sort of stuff. And it just coincided with we, we played about and did a few shows and rehearsals for there, but it never kind of got, it never really recovered for there. And then Elliot said that he had to leave because he was, uh, he was uh, going to, go be a pilot or whatever and I was like right okay so Stuart left and Gary was going to be the singer and I was like right at this point we'd had Sally and or Steph potentially practice where as a couple of times playing saxophone type thing but it was like as soon as we got like to that level it was like right, well we need to you're now starting to get any proper complex music because we've got an alto sax a tenor sax we've got guitars standard tuning and all that sort of stuff you have mm-hmm. to sing in key you have to sing in key you have to sing in the right pitch you have to sing in the right or it's going to sound mental mm-hmm. and it was just like and it's unfair to ask Stuart with like none of that knowledge to to be able to do that if you know what I mean and it's not that he could not mm-hmm. he probably could have but he just didn't have the time to dedicate it to it so he left and then we obviously got Gary in we get the two girls in on saxophones and then we got Callum in on keyboards and mm-hmm. I was like I really love like political music, political stuff, but screamy, shouty punk or whatever, fast punk. It just was never going to get in the radio. People weren't going to listen to it. And I quite like the, the juxtaposition of folk dancing 
to slow ska songs that are fully political agendas, slagging yes. the government, slagging all that, and they're like, hey, having <clears throat> a wee nice like dancing, and then like our pure, fast, proper ska bangers are just love songs, like Stay Young, mm-hmm. Stay Free is just, just a love song, man. It's just just mm-hmm. about what it is. Do you know what I mean? And I like I like that sort of that juxtaposition, and it made us as a band that was the most musical we'd ever been, and. We started off slow and then we got like the opportunity to support the Sherlocks. So we went on the tour with the Sherlocks and then on the back of that we got the tour with Melbourne, went on oh. tour with Melbourne. Then it was like we just started to build up and build up and we were by the end of it like we were talking to fucking loads of like A and R's that were what to give us money to today, X, Y, and Z. We played fucking pretty much every venue in Scotland pretty much every decent venue in Britain, being on the telly, being on the radio, being in the papers, being in FIFA, fucking you name it, we'd been we'd done it type thing. But it also just sort of coincided with well, there's seven years in the band now. The mere the chances of me getting to like when my career and stuff I've started to make like decent money and it's life's not about money, but you want a house, you want to start providing. I was getting to be 28, 29, 30, thinking, right, well, I want kids, I want to get married, I want to settle down, mm-hmm. and all that. And it, it get to the point where you've got seven folk in the band, three of them work full-time, so could pay for practice or pay for new equipment, pay for PR campaigns and studio time mm-hmm. and all that. Other folk were students, couldn't afford that. And I used to be like, I'd just pay it. I would be like, I'd pay their half and be like, just tap me back or like hang me on my back because but I'm cutting my own nose off despite my face here. We've got an unbelievable tune that needs to be where it needs to be. And mm-hmm. for the sake of three three hundred quid, am I gonna no pay that because I can afford it with they can just to miss out on the opportunity. Do you know what I mean? Like you you've got to fucking speculate to accumulate and all that sort of stuff. But then it started to become a point where it was like we had Ayla, my young my oldest, and then it was like, right bedtime seven I can be at practice for eight but I've got to be back home for ten because I've got like work tomorrow plus I need to want to be a dad I want to help I want to be a husband all that sort of stuff and you'd show up at practice at eight folk would show up at half eight quarter to nine quarter past nine you'd piss about on the guitar you'd piss about talking shit and all that sort of stuff you'd do 30 minutes of actual practice and then be like I've got to go home man I've got to go home mm-hmm. and then yeah, times that by the girls, Steph get married. She mm-hmm. now a mum as well. She was she started to get ill as well, and it just became like, would you make the choice? Would you want to be there? Would it be in a cool band or do I want to be a good dad? And it was like we just started to start talking about nitrogen where we came from. I didn't get to do anything I've done in my life that wasn't for having a good mum and a dad. So I was like, mm-hmm. it's more important to me now than being in a cool band is I've got to be a dad, man. So, I mean, it's no worth giving it up to do this we're not getting anywhere and I'm missing out on milestones in life and all that like we went the Melbourne tour Ayla, Ayla was born do you know what I mean so like for and it's sounds daft it's only two weeks right but see when babies are tiny man two weeks is, it's like that man it's like a different person you're watching on FaceTime or watching videos to be like oh look she did this or she did that and even like the lowest point stuff too like Alana not being able to sleep because of feeding and bum changes and all that stuff and you know you're at a venue till fucking to midnight, you feel in the bollocks, folk want to talk to you and get your picture taken and fucking all that stuff and you think it's great and you start in and you want to get to sleep because you've had up your adrenaline filled day, you're now on a massive come down because the weight off your shoulders is finished and then mm-hmm. she wants to get to sleep, so she wants you to be a da. You know, like, I can't do this, I'm fucked. Life takes over for real, yeah. 100%. Mm-hmm. But it Life was just up Oh, it was me. And look, I will be forever grateful in life. I've been there's two prongs in my life where I've been unbelievably blessed in life, and that's been able to peek behind the curtain at football. You know, I've been unbelievable places and get to do things that folk would only dream of being able to do. And it's the same in music, man. Like we've been, I've been everywhere, side of the stage, fucking tea in the park. I've been side of the stage, belly drum. Get to meet my heroes, support my heroes. I've had people singing my song that I wrote in my house, sitting in my pants, do you know what I mean? And seeing folk get tattoos or whatever, and you think, fucking hell, man, that's mental. You know, I'm just a wee fanny for Nightridge, do you know what I mean? No. 
No, I've got to give you a shout. You sort of mean <coughs> me and some Dell tickets for uh, the Sherlock's gig. Is it you? Are you, Paul? I think it was that I couldn't go. Uh, and, uh, and I, still well, but I remember a few times that I've, I think once I went to the sound station uh, and I sat in, in a, a practice. Right. Uh, and I remember, <laughs> I remember filming it and showing you a couple of clips and you went, mm, nah. I get that. And I got to like the ninth video. And they were like, can you edit it? I don't know if this phone can edit me. Was that long ago, man? I'm pretty sure it was like an S4 or something, like a Samsung S4 or something. And that's what we used to be like. That's what, like, that was a, that was a, not sure, that was part of the whole mystique about the Begbies is I love the fact that we made it look like we didn't care. It was a piss take. We were like, Funny, show up late, then do a sound check, and then still be unbelievable. Never miss a beat, never miss a note. I've never stopped in a song because I've made we've made mistakes. Like, do you know what I mean, like you go to see some bands. I went to see Libertines, fucking at the Usher Hall or whatever it was, a, a two months ago, and there they stop. You know, they made a mistake, went out of time, so they stopped and restarted the song. But we worked so hard to be like network talking to folk, getting contacts rubbing shoulders with folk, fucking complimenting folk, coming up with ideas and all that sort of stuff. Like, you look back to the Choose Rude Nights, right? I, no, I, I used to be my, fanzine things, by the way. They were class. Uh, and I got back, so that was like the Sex Pistols and all the punks did that back in, it was called Sniff and Glue. And that's mm-hmm. what they used to do. They would go venue to venue and they'd write about like, so the Sex Pistols might have been on tour, but they would talk about the Damned or they would talk about fucking Susie Shoe and the Banshees or the skids or something like that like they would talk about other bands they only just like they'd promote themselves too obviously they fucking would but you look back at the Choose Roots mate and like we spoke about Lewis Capaldi mm-hmm. before he was anything other than just a wee guy for Whitburn we spoke about the Snuts we spoke about St Phoenix we spoke about fucking every band that's like coming through that's that's made it we spoke about it before they were like cool or like selling tickets we'd say sure, go same. check check right. these bands out man because they're class and and all that sort of stuff and the choose rude stuff was like massive it was great and that really seen as like that's what i get right now with the west Lovian music scene is like it's dead difficult but i see bands that are still doing the same thing that we were doing like 15 years ago and it's like you feel you want to get them doing and I've done it I, I did it with uh, the you know the barrels what they're called now hot lips or something like that the two. oh yeah uh, you're talking about Matty and Gary McLean Gary McLean and Matty aye Michael is it no oh Michael, Michael. yes Michael. Aye. 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 I had that I like sat they came came to my house and I just like this is what you need to do don't do this we are single like pay for a, a marketing campaign then you just release it to your pals or then you just put it on YouTube like you have to pay and build it up and then you sell physical tickets for venues, make them sell them, you sell yours online, because that's all the stuff that venues and promoters do, but you, you get lured in because you think, fuck, it's King Tut's, brilliant man, I better fucking I, that we can't say not to that, or it's a support slot we are banned and it's like, because we were in the background, we, we sat, we played, choose, we played Fuck Yes, which was a club night on a Tuesday yeah. night at King Tut's, sold it out after it, the guys for King Tuts and DF concerts were like, Mom, we'll go to broadcast yeah, and we'll get a we'll get a talk, we'll get a meeting hang and we'll discuss like what's next steps for you. So we're in there and they're like, it was great. You sold all your tickets out, but you sold them physically. You only sold 13 tickets online, right? And you're like, all right, what does that matter for? Like we sold 300 tickets physically. And they're like, aye, that's great. But the whole presence is how do you do it online? Like pre-sales, online tickets like a successful band or a band that's like making waves or making a big splash in the thing will sell their tickets virtually because people have heard of you and they'll go fuck there's the Begbies I've got a gig I better go get that rather than the Begbies telling them by the way we've got a gig do you want to buy a ticket office so it was like try to, it was like it's almost more impressive to sell your fifth because to class it as like a sell it for the venue or whatever you have to sell 50 tickets or something stupid like that online mm-hmm or sell out your online allocation and then you sell your physical tickets because if there's three bands playing or four bands playing you all get 50 tickets each so there you go that's 200 tickets plus 50 online that's 250 that's sold out so that's how they used to do it 
and the like, if you that's almost more impressive to sell it the fifty online without you having to do anything because it tells you where you're standing. Then physically go door to door, hiring buses, getting your pals, getting your mas, getting your dads, getting your aunties, getting your uncles, and basically bringing Knightsridge to Glasgow for one day a week and then back home. What you want is Glasgow to come to see Knightsridge. Do you know what I mean? That's basically what you want them to do, mm. and that's where like. That's what happened when folks started to get involved with Lewis. It was like, take your music down, then you leave it, then you give your music away for free, start focusing on like actually writing tunes, getting onto Spotify, get onto Spotify playlists, making waves in there. That's how the snuts were so massive. You know, the snuts were massive on Spotify. Like mm-hmm. the Glasgow track or whatever it was at the time was getting like demo, 200, eh? 200, 300, and 50,000 mm-hmm. views or listens on Spotify. It's like that matters. That really matters. Like that's what folk look out for. And I see bands now still doing the same thing. Like I see my mate will go folk will text me to be like, Oh, you coming to such and such a single launch? And I'm like, No, because I can't. It's this happening. It's not that I didn't like them and I I didn't want them to do well, but it's like people that are releasing singles or all that, they're, they're they're quite clearly still trying to get signed or get a record deal or make it. Like, if they just love the music, I'll come along and watch them because it's just guys having a great time and reminisce or whatever. But releasing singles, releasing videos and all that, but still making all the mad mistakes that we made 10, 15 years ago. And I know it's not doing them any favours. Eh? And you're like, I can't, that's why I can't go. I've only been at a gig for a West Lothian band in fucking years. And I'd be at a gig every Friday or Saturday. I'd go, I'd go watch all the bands because... Mm-hmm. that's what you have to do you've got to support each other that's how you make a scene do you know what I mean look at what happened with the view on the back of that scene Sergeant got signed the law got signed do you know what I mean all these people made mm-hmm. careers out of it even to the extent like you know look at Arctic Monkeys and the Rascals and all the bands and all that that came through that scene that's what you mm-hmm. need look at Lewis you know, alright the Snuts have got their own merit because of what they've done or whatever but it absolutely helps to have a fucking mega star best pal selling it the, 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 the charts look at look look Le Volpe or whatever he's called now as well like he's he's riding that wave of people do you know what I mean and that's not me saying that they didn't have good music by the way they're fucking phenomenal musicians that's not taking anything away from them but it definitely definitely helps do you know what I mean Aye. and you watch you watch guys that I know are like working their arse off and doing great things but they're still worried about things like Samas or fucking playing the King Tut's winter nights or the the new year, the summer nights and all that sort of stuff and that was like that guy for, for King Tut's me sat and spoke said that like the summer months weekends and the winter months like uh, over Christmas they're the worst time for Glasgow venues because all the students go home students are there Saturday Sunday because they live in dorms Monday to Friday they go back to their mums and dads Saturday Sunday so mm-hmm. that's why all the big bands or all the, the scenester bands get like all the good support so on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night at King Tut's or whatever it is because that's the audience to get students in and that's when they start reaching out to bands who West Lobby and to say do you want to headline King Tut's on a Saturday night and everybody here goes fuck I oh my god that'll be amazing and it's like aye but there's nobody there there's nobody there that, that venue will sit empty unless you show up and they show you no gratitude for selling that venue for them because they're not interested do you know what I mean? They just can't have these wee guys go to university, get business management degrees, come out, become a booker for King Tuts and think doing a Facebook event and putting a poster up is them doing their job as a promoter. They leave it all to the bands. Do you know what I mean? You sell 50 tickets to play. If you don't, you have to pay. Do you know what I mean? You end up wanting to pay for the tickets that you didn't sell. So mm-hmm. bands end up saying, right, well, if it's £7 a ticket and you keep £2 it, we'll just sell them for a fiver and they'll make any money. And it's like, well, how does that work? Do you know what I mean? How how does a band how's a band ever going to reinvest money into themselves? And that's what I see all the time now. And you'll see it too, because yours have got social media. I didn't add delete at all, but you'll see bands for West Lovian. Next time you see a band for West Lovian play King Tuts, I bet you it's either the summer nights or it's the winter nights or it's a Saturday, Sunday, because that's when the venues will sit empty. So they come to bands that they know will bring bus loads of people to their venue, buy their beer, give them fucking income and give them absolutely nothing in return and anything else they just looked in their nose at them do you know what I mean? so mm-hmm. that's why I kind of go watch bands anyway man I get too angry I can't really mean like it's 
because you've had that that peak behind the can that peak behind the curtain and the knowledge of what's going on, it's drives you nuts. Aye, it's it's not so much that it drives you nuts. It's, I know how hard these folk work, man. I know what it means to them. Do you know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I know I know what it's like to sit up to two or three in the morning, try to perfect the song, try to get the right bit or not being happy with something that you've paid a fortune with and it's just slightly know what you wanted it to be as Paul can attest to just coming to watch his fucking practice as a pure perfectionist. I'd be like, no, I don't like that. I don't want that. Check that out, do this or whatever. And I know that that's what they're all doing. I know that they fucking burst the gut and it's like the lure of doing these things. See the many times that we were told we'd play three in the park. This is this year definitely sell me sell me these venues out, sell me these tickets and you'll be you'll be absolutely you'll be one of the ones there and then the votes happen or the hang and you're not on the bill. Oh man, it was nothing I could do about it. It was Jim Gertley or Vic Galloway hadn't listened to your tune, so I'd never heard the you know, like, like talk shit, man. It's the same shit every single year. Like do you know what I mean? Aye. I feel like I've fucking schooled by the way, really. <laughs> I feel like I've just opened so many different avenues. So much, man. Honestly, you don't know. Took in so much, honestly. But and it's like you said, it's just it's that stuff where you just it's a pure talent, and it takes balls, mate. Somebody stand up in front of you, and even if it's a five people in a room, to pure put your heart and soul into something, and that that takes guts, mate. It takes absolute guts, and we've said that for the start. It's why. We and it's dead easy now. Folk are listening, saying, "Oh, it's because he's a fucking mega star or whatever." But that was my always my first impressions of Lewis, and he was a wee guy. Was I remember I just told you what I was like at fifteen. I was a wee fanny man. I, my ass would have collapsed if you'd asked me to stand up in front of anybody and sing. Mm-hmm. And for a wee boy to not even just that, like even me as an adult, I'd still be apprehensively walking into the Harvey. I fucking grew up there. I knew everybody in there, but I still felt like. I need to be on my fucking toes here. I know that, like, I'm, I'm a confident enough. If I get slagged, am I going to be all right? Can I handle myself? And I have, like, a wee guy that age coming in mm-hmm. to sing songs, but also having to fucking talk to adults, be in that environment and stuff. That's why we were like, get them on support, man. Get them in here. We'd give support slots to whoever that was coming through. Like, we'd, we had shows we would try and get. West Lovian bands on the bill wherever we could or bands that we've seen it's the same how Gary Ovens joined the bands like Gary we used to get him to be our main support when we played shows and being like a mm-hmm. brilliant singer and a great wee guy and then when you know when we had the opportunity we was like get him in the band then do you know what I mean like what, what we worried about and you'll have seen yourself with things we've had fucking old guys in the band young guys in the band lassies <laughs> in the band anybody uh, that has value and loves music man get them involved you just made me think of the last time I seen you at the Harvey, it was Lewis supporting. No, it was mm-hmm. like, And his wee brown yeah. coat, and I think he'd, mm-hmm. a couple months later, he was supporting Jake Bug and Redden or something. We've been, uh, he played at the Goshen and Broxburn, whereas, and him and uh, like when we, and uh, again, it's that mad thing where we just didn't care, and it was by by chance that it happened, but like, we're trying to sound check, and everybody's gone mental, and Gary's just, started playing fucking Oasis tunes and Lewis comes up and joins them and they're singing fucking Don't Look Back in Anger and everybody's gone mental and all that and you think this is what it's all about man this is what music's all about do you know what I mean mm-hmm. we're, in a pub in, we're in a pub in Livingston other bands would come here and be like I'm not playing because there's no sound engineer there's no sound tech or whatever we were like fucking it's no the Oscars or the fucking Brits mate <laughs> just play play tunes mate like do you know what I mean these I people are, in Glasgow yet <laughs> I, I was like these, these people are here They've got fucking. They've got lives. They've got jobs. Just fucking play songs, man. Stop taking it so, so serious. Punk it's a pure punk yeah, it's just like it. Stop taking it so serious, man. There's a time and a place to take it serious and all that. And it's no there. It's no worrying about fucking the sound isn't quite right in a fucking shitty pub in Livingston. Of course, it's not. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What did you expect? Exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, I said you could uh, take care of it. After we've done the babies. To, to be pretty frank here, as the answer to questions, because you've pretty much <laughs> come on, and I'm trying to maybe Go. readjust these questions to kind of I, ask me why I hate new avenues. <laughs> right, okay, I'll I'll go with this one. You you, may, you kind of touched on your previous job roles. Um, 
I know you best from being a, a manager in a, a certain retailer, which I, I won't mention, mm-hmm. just in case, in case you've caught Get royalties. <laughs> Get royalties, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I worked in retail uh, in Matalan when I was 16, and I went through a vast array of different roles within Matalan, but never ever got the badge for it, or the paycheck, to be honest. Oh, yeah. um, That's retail. Exactly. Which leads me to my, my, my kind of basic question here. What's the lowlights of working in retail, which are kind of obvious, and what's your highlights of working in retail? If there so, are any. <laughs> well, one of the lowlights, and it's not one to do with working in retail, I suppose, but at a certain point it is, it was like, you undersell what you do. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, when I worked in retail, I fucking work myself. I basically run a multi-million pound business mm. by my ethics, my hang way, it was my displays. I hired the staff, I trained them, I gave them all the information and all that sort of stuff. But you'd go to like, so I would go to like meals or dinners or stuff with like Alana, who's like I said, an actuary and she's fucking in the faculty of actuaries and she's got a master's degrees and all this shit. And folk could be like, what do you do? And it's like, oh, I'm fucking head accountant for this or that and they'd come to me what do you do and I'd be like fuck it I'll work in a shop do you know what I mean because yeah. I was like how am I competing with that man do you know what I mean how am I even even if I did tell you I was a manager in a shop it doesn't sound any better than saying I work in a shop because it's that stigma of working in retail that folk just any they treat you like shite and they think the job's dead easy like anybody could do it it's like open the shutter put the money in and then you, you, you'll you make it you'll make money do you know what I mean so mm. That's one of the low lights in terms of it. the biggest low light here is just the fact that people are the worst fucking folk on planet Earth, man. <laughs> I used to remember your statuses on Facebook and <laughs> your tweets and Mate, that about customers picking up shoes and then putting them down. But, and... but oh, see, if you could... Just... If, you could hold up, if you could hold up a mirror to folk, they'd be a fucking shame to themselves, man. Do you know what I mean? And that I've always been like that. Like, always, you know what I'm like? I'm fucking... Uh, how opinionated I am now is how I'm like if anybody confronts me. I'd be like the same in the shop. And I'd be like, so? Who cares? What you yeah. got to do about it? Like, what are you talking to me like that for? If you talk to me like a dick, I'll treat you like a dick. Like, do you know what yeah, I mean? exactly. And, and that was like the thing we used to get all the time. Always make me laugh about people would be like, I want my money back. And like, sorry, you can't because we don't do it. I'm a doctor. I'm like, all right, thanks. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Fuck's that got to do anything? Like, do you want me to open the till and just give it back because you're a doctor? <laughs> and it was like, it is that thing where people just, and to be honest with you, it's not even just, it's everywhere now in, in the world. The world's a fucking horrible place now. Mm-hmm. Folk, have for, folk have forgot how to, be compa- I have uh-huh. how to be compassionate to each other. Do you know what I mean? Like, folk that work in offices don't have people come in and shout and scream at them. So why do people no. that work in offices think they can go into shops and shout and scream at folk? I beg to differ. <laughs> sure. I left well, my yeah, previous yeah. job as a manager in a call centre, mate, and I can, I can assure you I've been told to kill myself quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it's like, that's the stuff is folk have just lost the fucking, their mind when it comes to how to talk to you and interact with each other. Do you know what I mean? Like, we'd get old ladies come in and be like fucking touch her lassie in the belly being like oh how far along are you and you're like she's no pregnant man like <laughs> why would you do that like do you know what I mean like how embarrassing and then I'd have to I'd have man. to then talk like those lassies would then have to try and put on a brave face because in any other situation if that was a pub outside the work they'd be like what the fuck are you doing but it's they've got to be like ha 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 thanks I'm just and then you've got to, aye, and then you've got to you've got to go <laughs> talk to them after it and try and explain look I know how shite that is or you know you'd get folk that'd be like oh you, what's your what, what's your man up to the night and you'd be like God, the actual you know, got a girlfriend or I didn't have a boyfriend or whatever and you think what mm-hmm. are you doing like why are you asking that stuff or like yeah, the like, oh, you you've yeah. you've got to get a man or you've got to do this and it was all you see the worst side of people. When you work in uh, when you work in retail, highlights of working in retail is just like how proud of myself I am for what I achieved. Like, I started. I was supposed to go to art school. That was my thing. Right? I mm. again go back to high school. I've been artistic my whole life and got opportunities to go to art school, but I never passed English. So I never passed English in fucking fifth year for my higher. Then never passed it in sixth year, and then it was like do I go for another year of college to then go to art school where I'm going to have to fucking learn about Shakespeare again? I did Shakespeare as like 
because I was in a credit class, I did Shakespeare in second year and then I did Shakespeare in third year and Shakespeare in fourth year. And I was like, I'm fucking sick of this cunt. <laughs> By sixth year, I was like, you cannot pay me, you cannot pay me money to go to college and do that. So I got a job, got a job in retail and I get a work for Levi's. And again, it was like massively in music as well. We did something called Ones to Watch and the way the fly and basically like, when yeah. I built myself up, I used to hold the club nights. We opened the Canon Galleries. Uh, Levi's, like, we did a shop fit and the view played in it. Uh, had a club night and it was brilliant, but they fucking trashed the place and we ended up having to shut for, like, three days to clean it, but it was brilliant. I seen, like... The View's fans? Like, the View's fans just trashed the place? Uh, the View themselves, eh? Spraying champagne <laughs> and that. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 but I'm like, I'm supposed, to be the, I'm supposed to be the manager keeping the rain on it. And I'm like, yeah, fucking yeah, stay it, man. <laughs> fucking spray it, man, bro. And so is my show. And, uh, <laughs> and it was like, but we seen like, we did a bit, it was the, the bar fly down, down the bottom, like where the water is. And we'd had like fucking, but I seen Biffy Clyro in there, fucking uh, Maccabees, fucking, mm. uh, you name it. They were, they were there and it was that was that was class but I always remember my, my retail journey was my manager at the time was an absolute wee fanny right he was just an absolute wee dick and I remember being like 17 thinking mate see if you're on the night switch mate I'd battle you <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, coming. see if you're in get, by the way would get, you, you, just, you, would, you wouldn't last a minute man but see we used to get pay slips right and it was pure. I remember I was on three pound sixty eight. Right, it was my very first right. ever ever pay. I was on an eight hour contract, uh, and the way that the the pay slips went, they came in a big roll like that, and they were perforated, and you just pulled them off and handed them out to everybody that was. And because of the way the alphabet worked, his second name was the same as mine. He was Cormac or something, and I was Corbett. So I took my pay slip, opened it, and then was like, "What the fuck? Why have I got like?" I don't know, 1,700 quid or something like that, right? <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? And, but then I realised that actually they were attached and I bought them my manager's one. And then when I thought that, I thought, he gets that amount of money. He yeah. is an absolute useless wee jobby. How does he get... <laughs> I, I like, how does he get that much money? Like, Because then you start to work out and be like, that's that's 25 grand a year. Do you know what I mean? And this Aye. is this is 2003. That's 25 grand a year. Like, that's... That's a house, that's a car, that's a holiday. Mm-hmm. So I was like, fuck it, I'm working my way up, man. I'm getting that. Like, that's that's what I'm going to do. And then, like, building your way up. But retail was class, because you get to meet everybody today. Like, if folk, my wife moans about it all the time, because if it wasn't, now that I've gave up the band, I'm in a podcast, and if I, before the band, it was folk knew me for the shop. But I remember being, we're in immigration queue to go to Mexico, right? And we're standing, <laughs> and you do that, you do that mad snake yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Kept going past, gone, kept going past, and this boy just and Lassie kept looking at me. Eventually, I was like, "What the fuck is it?" And they're like, "Are you the guy that works in Levi's?" <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, "I'm the guy. I'm the guy that works in Levi's." <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's pure random, and that's what it's like. That's what it's like. I'm just a fame, fame junkie. Man. I mean, to be fair. At the time in Matalan, like, are you the guy who's just standing in a monkey suit at the front with an NSPCC bucket? Yeah, I said, no, mate, I. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm luckily, I'm luckily out, out of the world of retail. And to be honest with you, I'm pure smashing it in my new job. And it's because of everything Boss. that I learned in retail. Do you know what I mean? Aye. You do it's a sort of, fucking hotbed of education, retail. Can, Right. And it's just, but everything that you learn is just about being a, a person. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's being a leader or a manager. It's like, mm-hmm. if you start le- like De- pure David Brent in it and lecturing folk about how good you are, <laughs> folk, folk will just turn off to you straight away, man. Oh, 100%. Just talk, 100%. Just talk to them like normal folk in that and you'll be sound like. Exactly. Man of the people. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said we are the people. I almost said we are the people. That went down well, isn't it? Oh, cheers very much, mate. Was, okay, do, you know what, do you know what to know why I hate Livingston, the football club? Man? You know what? Do you know why we'll leave that to last, but we'll finish on a high, mate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my next question was in relation to you becoming a father and a husband, but let's be honest, I think we've, yep. we've basically scraped the barrel of that one. You <laughs> very much covered that. Um, bit of a random question, just to throw it out. To be on stage with any band, any time, at any event, 
who would that band be and what my band place in that band? What, what oh, so I'm playing in the band. Yes. So I'm playing in the band. Uh, probably, and it's not just because we've, we've spoke about it, but I'd probably, I will say Sex Pistols purely because nothing to do with the music. Like now and CD and stuff, they're good, but at the time of life, they were fucking horrendous. They were terrible. But it wasn't just that. It was the whole movement thing. It was like everything that's missing now in society. We think of COVID and rules and fucking the cunts in Westminster having, <laughs> uh, them having parties yeah. whilst we can't even go to loved ones funerals and all that and we just have to accept mm-hmm. it we've just got to sit and take it and that whole punk explosion of just like youth subculture and all that was was unbelievable like you know don't get me wrong it became like the, the original punks hated it because it came postcard punk you know what I mean like a stupid Mohican and a leather jacket and all that sort of stuff but yeah. at the time it was nothing but like just expressionism it was rebellion against Tory Britain stiff up or like that sort of break the post-war sort of stereotypes, eh, grin and bear it, get on with it, we're supposed to accept that times are hard and all that, and rich people are rich and poor people are poor and all that type yeah. of stuff. And So to be anywhere on stage or to have experienced any of it, I said the Sex Pistols at the time, just because it would have been outrageous to be part of just such a massive, massive mm-hmm. movement. We are only about it for like two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, only about seven, seven to nine. Hi, only two years, and you ask anybody in my punk band, they'll tell you straight away. Sex Pistols. Straight away, the even things like, mind, and even the amount of bands that sprung, like Joy Division sprung for watching, watching fucking Sex Pistols, like the bands that probably would never have made it or got to where they are, like the Clash and fucking the Dam, the Jam, all that sort of stuff, would never have got to the the levels it was if it wasn't for the Sex Pistols and that making making the waves if you know what I mean mm-hmm. just to jump in on that question did you see them in 2007 that was terrible the Pistols I've seen them I've seen them too many I'm actually getting that way we got I've got to, stop, got to see the Libertines now as well because I've been at the Libertines and lucky enough to have been there when they were at their chaotic best fucking Carol and Pete hating each other no showing up all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff I've been in venues waiting and they've no been there and now watching them, it's like, it's brilliant, don't get me wrong, it's great, I love it, but I've got that thing that I just said about got to watch West Lovian bands, it's like, they're still trying to be relative, like, they're still writing new music, they're still hanging, and it's like, they're no junkies, they're best pals, they've got money, they're living where they are, and it's just not the same, it's like, it's uh-huh. just, it's not the same anymore, like, and it's, I kind of, one part of the, the, the Sex Pistols things that I kind of liked was the fact that they still just, we were just old men just doing what they like doing, if you know what I mean. There was a few bits in it that I think it still shape, but I I would never go back to watch the Sex Pistols and I'll hundred percent not be back to watch the Liberty either. <laughs> nice did, did you go? I was there in two thousand seven. I was what fourteen. So it was like my first exposure to all that. So Aye. They were, just, was that the one at the SECC? Aye. They had golded in the DJ set before it. Mm-hmm. And they, and were moaning. they were moaning. Remember the Sex Pistols? Johnny Rotten came out and started moaning because we were, and he was moaning because we were booing him and throwing stuff at that Goldie guy or whatever. But he was playing like uh, fucking drum and bass for the it's Sex Pistols. Maybe reggae. Aye, and like, reggae and shit. Aye, and I was like, get this off, man. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember that. It's just one like. Being 14 like, exposed to that's mental. Okay. Right, PC, what else? Okay, so may as well move on to hearts. We're good to move on to hearts. Right, go and for then it. we'll move on to the one that you want to answer, which I'll pretend I don't hear. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to relive a moment in hearts history from a player's point of view, who and what would it be? I'm just going to leave them out. <laughs> Ken, what's going uh, on? What, what do you mean? Like, so I like score a winning goal or. Anything, so for example, a takeover, a, a winning goal in a cup final, or if you were to get in the mind of that player carrying out that action and relive well, it re- as that person, who would you be? What did, would be the scenario? Because he did 5-1. I could tell you my 5-1 story because I hate 5-1, right? Oh, obviously, what? unbelievable as a Hearts fan. I broke my leg at 5-1, right? Oh, right. In, the first, in the first goal, I broke my leg, right? So was in like... No way. Out, 
Aye, but I'd already I tore my knee ligaments before, so I was at the game in like a Forrest Gump bracing, right? <laughs> but because wow. because I couldn't, we went on the bus, right? And because I couldn't sit in the bus, the knee bit it had like gears, so you were supposed to like put these pins in, and it stopped your knee from bending. To get on the bus, I took the the gear out so I could sit in it and got fucking mangled, right? Got absolutely steaming, wrecked, right? And and forgot to put the the gear back in, so. Darren Bar scored, pandemonium mayhem. Somebody jumped in my back and my fucking leg folded that way. <laughs> so I was like, Fuck. oh my, even wrecked. It was the saddest thing that's ever happened to my whole entire life. And I was Not wrecked. So I think I spent like the rest of the day like at the St. John's ambulance bit for like Rudy's second, uh, for the second be Rudy, then stayed there in half time, <laughs> went to the toilet, came back up, fucking. <sighs> Danny Granger had scored a penalty and Ryan McGowan had made it four. I'd missed all that. And then got back to see fucking Rudy make it five. Went back to, didn't go to the hospital directly after that. Tried to go back to Gorgie, to the street party. The bus, the supporters bus, and my mates being mates, ditched me. But the fucking tope, like, the, where the fucking luckies is on the Gorgie yeah. road. They all went, they all fucking sprinted to be part of the thing. By the time I got there, all the celebrations, the bus, the players, everything had been done and they were away and they were gone up to fucking Princess Street now to, to go out. So I was like, I'll have to go home, man. My leg is like spaghetti. I'm fucked, man. So went to, I had to go straight to A&E and then that was it. I fucking tore on my cruciate ligaments and broke the fucking tibia on my fucking leg or whatever. Mm, so Not man. I would maybe say if I one player just so I didn't have to say I had a fucking broken leg. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I'd probably say like Stevie Fulton or Gary Locke for lifting the cup in 1998, if you know what I mean. It's the iconic moment type thing. Gary Locke, as we've said before, like fucking Hearts fan for, for birth. I love that. His interview will open goal and he, his mum and that, or they sat him down to have the proper conversation with him to say, mate, you're actually playing my hearts, you need to take your hearts bed covers off and your posters of Gary Locker, uh, Gary <laughs> Mackay off your wall. You're actually playing for hearts now. You gotta take that down. So <laughs> yeah. probably that moment. And again, it's like I'll say this to you, Andy, right? This is one thing and you'll probably it probably didn't matter to you now, but it's the slight disappointment uh, I would think I'd have if I was a Hibs fan is that all the nonsense that happened in the aftermath of the full time whistle at, mm-hmm. at Hamden. Like missing that moment of like the overpouring the emotion, the players going around the park, covering the lap of honour and all that type of stuff. It's like the, the, uh, they're the things I remember more than like bits of the game. And don't get me wrong, you've got the fucking elation of the, the last minute winner. If you could have picked a, a dream scenario to win the cup, you would you'd pick that other than it would be hearts you'd have scored it against no no Rangers. But oh hundred percent. It was it was outrageous. And that's what, like, so that's the argument I have with 5 1 all the time, right? So 5 1's been and done, does my head in there. I hate that we still sing about it's piss. But you felt what there. it's like. I wasn't there. You know, I, but, you, but you felt what it's oh, like and were, were there oh, for yeah, 2016 yeah. or whatever. It's the greatest. No, no, I wasn't actually there in 2016. All oh, right, but you, you still get to, you still get to oh, think with oh. it. Do you know what I mean? The, mm. the elation, it, and that's like when I think, right imagine that moment but imagine it in the biggest derby that there's ever ever been and ever ever will be mm. imagine not just winning it but absolutely annihilating your biggest rivals like we the only way that will ever be like one up is if we play each other in the Champions League final do you know what I mean mm. or like at the end of the season us v you win or wins the league for the first exactly. time in 100 years or whatever do you know what I mean and it's like and it's great, but you can't just live off that. Like Hearts and Hibs are terrible for that. Like we're still living off twenty sixteen. I and you see our arguments on Twitter, like <sighs> over the next thought. It's been six years oh, since yeah. you last since you last finished above us. And I'm like, I know, but fucking four of those seasons as well, you finished seven. Like, surely we're arguing about who's got the fucking biggest micro dick. Like, what? <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, na- nobody cares. You're arguing about fucking centimetres here. Nobody's getting out of this way a fucking, like, any bit of pride. Do you know what I mean? It's mental. So, aye, I'd probably yeah. have that. What about you, Andy? What would be what would be your uh, what would be your moment if you were, could be a football player? You, you David oh, Gray, you scoring that header? 
No, it's Paul Hanlon at Tyne Castle. Uh, the two each? Two each, because I was there and I ripped a £200 jacket as well. Yeah, yeah. £200 pretty green, pretty green jacket, you, like that. Can you remember that we almost scored and won it with like the last kick uh, of the ball? Hi, and I was like, "What the hell, man?" But that was a uh, my That's biggest thing moment, with that. Man. Aye, but they're bro- they're great moments, don't they? Like they're they're unbelievable moments because Hearts were in total domination of that game until Jason Cummins scored. Like, and the arse had fell out of us because we'd it was I think one of the biggest gripes I used to have with Robbie, and it was like the Craig Levine mindset, and it's good that he's he's totally went away for that. He's that he has is that whole like shut up shop and consolidate at 2-0 because 2-0 is weird it's, I feel more uneasy at football games at 2-0 than a day when it's 1-0 like, do you know what I mean because it almost feels like 1-0 if it goes to 1-1 you kind of expect right well 1-1 it can happen but when you're 2-0 mm-hmm. it's almost that comfort zone where it feels merry a kick in the teeth if it goes to 2 each because you think how the fuck have we thrown away a 2 goal lead if you know what I mean you seen my United the other night there against Villa aye it sucks, sucks, life. Life it sucks the life out of you, mate. It sucks the absolute life out of you. What about you, Paul? Fucking Diesel on the big drum or something? Have you just got any of this? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Oh, I'm just going to fucking... Um, <laughs> Jamie McAllister. Jamie McAllister. I've, I've got two kind of squiggling about my mind, similar to yourself, but either Stuart Lovell lifting the CIS Cup or even being Jim McAllister when he's playing, eh, been played through and goal. Am I going to win a major title for Livingston? Like the first major domestic trophy. Aye. It's a shame who it happened against, wasn't it? Aye, it was, mate. Aye. It's even very <laughs> a shame the fact that I watched it in Channel 5 in my room with a wee fucking video, a VCR TV combo. Mate, are you yeah. telling me that I was at that game and you won me? And I hate Livingston. This is the, that's the sentence I get for every single person that I know that doesn't support Livingston. Yeah, Mate, it was, that I was not at that game for multiple reasons. But when yeah. I was tail not to buy one ticket and two go yeah. But um, right. aye, uh, but I think I'm going to go with the uh, probably in the mind of David Martindale when he realises he's, <laughs> he's the manager of a Premiership football team after doing a prison <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and growing up in Tegs Hill, being a product yeah, yeah. of his environment and becoming what yeah. he became. Just yeah. I think, imagine what goes through his head thinking that. Like, yeah. How have I ended up here? Obviously, through hard work, determination to change his life, which he's done. Making more money selling gear. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Oh, I like that. Wait. <laughs> Allegedly. Aye, allegedly. Uh, Got to say say allegedly, sorry. Got to say allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. But uh, it's weird. It's like, I feel sorry for Livingston in that sense is that like, he's did too much too soon. Do you know what I mean? And I get it. Try to build up and all that. I get it. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, you need too big a stadium that's not needed. Like, just all the dunes and ups and all that sort of stuff. And it's hard. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, so, uh, Hearts and Hibs fucking struggle with folk got to Celtic and Rangers because it's easy, isn't it? A folk, it's easy option. You could then get slagged if your team's winning every week, so it's easy to hide behind it. it takes a set of boys to support somebody that isn't it. Celtic or Rangers, like 100%. When you're brought up on it, it's a bit of a difference. It is, it's, I was brought up, I didn't get a choice when I was born. Do you know what I mean? I did not get a choice. And don't get me wrong, like, there'll be there's a big, massive majority of Celtic and Rangers fans that are in the exact same boat as us. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. they've been, been ingrained in it and they, they grow up with it and all that sort of stuff. But they also miss out in some of the aspects. Of, and it's, it's weird to say that Rangers have kind of experienced it from no, what it's like in our perspective. 55. Aye. Aye. But like, do you know what I mean? Like having those lows and coming up and, and, and doing all that sort of stuff, they've kind of had a, a sample. But that'll go with me till the day we die is Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, Motherwell or whoever could should never be able to look at themselves in the mirror that Rangers can go to the bottom of Scottish football and come back to the top and win it. And Hearts and Hibs and Aberdeen never even got fucking close to it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like show a we bit. We got relegated in that time, eh? So same, uh-huh. same. Well, we but got that's demoted. what I mean. Both of us. You aye, got, we, got, aye, we got demoted, mate. That's how better. That's how better I am. <laughs> I like that. Right, <laughs> aye. Aye. but uh, but it's true, and it's like that's kind of in this moment in time. I felt like like Hearts and Hibs. I've said it this year. Like if Hearts finish third and get Europe this year, brilliant. It's great, right? But just getting to Europe's not enough. Like you have you to, you have to qualify. You do something on it. Go, yeah. Get into the get into the Europa League stages or whatever. Spend a bit of money, like invest. Like it's great that Hibs have spent and got three million for for Boyle, right? That's brilliant. And Hearts are trying to get that mindset where bring a player in for half a million and sell them for five and keep that conveyor belt coming. Bring somebody in, sell them. But on the back of that, you've got to be successful. You've got to have European monies coming in because that will get you a better player. And then you can build up because Hearts and Hibs and Aberdeen, mm-hmm. we did the same. We say, oh, we want to win the league. Right, fine, great. That should always be the ambition of the football club. You want to your mouth is. No. But you've got, to, uh, you've got to invest and you've got to take the opportunities. Like this year, if Hearts get knocked out of the cup this round or next round or Hibs go out next round or whatever, but you finish third, that's not an achievement, man. Like... It's, Aye, it's fine. It's good. But don't get me wrong, and it's got its benefits. And and for where we've been, we'll take that. Like Hearts are on the verge. I've said this before on the podcast. But if Hearts don't finish for this year, this run of not finishing in the top three in Scotland becomes the standalone second worst run in the club's history. Do you know what I mean? And that's like in 1874 till now. That's what we're on the brink of. And that's where like the argument. And that's because if that, it'll go six years, so that'll be the longest that we've ever been outside the top three positions in Scotland, right? Because it's not trying to be funny, it's not trying to rub it in because you're the Hibs fan or whatever, but historically, Hearts are the third biggest team in Scotland. We're not the third successful, that's Aberdeen. They've won European trophies and that, but in recent history, Hearts are the third most successful team in Scotland and the biggest team in Scotland. And that's where it's like, I finished third this year, we kind of get an excuse for it. But next year, if we finish third again, no trophies, then he closed the gap on Celtic or Rangers. That's not <coughs> progress. That's not progress. Do you know what I mean? And, yep. and that's why folk, and you know my thoughts on Jack Ross, and it wasn't just because he was the Hibs manager. You know that I'd say, I, I told you that I think Sean Maloney is going to be a brilliant appointment for you and he's going to be a great coach. But mm-hmm. that's Hibs were, Hibs were right to get rid of Jack Ross. He's a serial, serial underachiever, mate. Like, you can't, what you got to. It wasn't like he was losing. Like Derek McInnes is a slightly different scenario, right? Derek McInnes got to like five cup finals in a row and came up against mm-hmm. the best Celtic side of a generation, right? And Brendan Rodgers, you can't blame mm-hmm. him for that. There's nothing much no. more he can do about that. But no. you just played fucking Hearts that were in the championship, get knocked. A out. shite Hearts team, by the way. I, uh, tell me about shite it. Hearts team. Terrible Hearts team. Then you've got fucking knocked out by St Johnston twice, lost Done in the it. final. Just get, go one nil, go one nil up against Celtic, and then fucking instantly concede and lose. Do you know what I mean? And it's like you kind of get away with that. Like as a club wants to grow, you kind of get away with that. I mean, especially when it looks like Ron Gordon's are eventually going to start pumping money into the club, and he's got a bit of ambition to pay higher wages so they can sell players for more money. Then that's what that's what you've got to do. And look so at the club. Aye, look at Hearts just now. Like John Souter, I firmly believe, will be the last Hearts player with Joe Savage in the building at Hearts that will leave for a free. You know, we've got Benny banging me, you've got Stephen Kingsley, you've got Cammy Devlin, you've got Barry McKay, Liam Boyce. All those people are sellable assets. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we can make we can make money off them uh, if they continue to develop, they continue to do well. If we're playing in Europe every year, that builds mm-hmm. you your platform to go and fucking challenge Celtic Rangers. I tot- no, I totally agree with you. And that, like, it does feel like something's gone on at Hibs. It does now that he's at the building. Right. And the thing is, you you all seen the arguments on Twitter, right? That Hibs didn't have a good season last season because we didn't. We didn't win one of the cups, and we should have because Aye. that wee team for Perth, their city doesn't even give a fuck about their team. Aye, yeah, mm-hmm. it's fairly Celtic and Come on, man. Uh, uh, but the, the, the other thing to it, conversation about as well. Uh, but your other thing too is the fact that like it's a it's a fact that like what you finished third by what nine points or something. There was we, we only had there was no derbies in there. No, no, one, one you, point it was. I one point it was. Oh, was it? All right, okay. One or well, four points or something. Uh, whatever it was, it's like 
you know, there's no derbies in there. The Hearts and Hibs, that's what they would measure their cocks against where each other fucking end up. But it was Jack Rossi's that it always records in big games like how did they perform against Celtic? How did they perform against Rangers? I think beat Rangers once, beat Aberdeen once, eh, twice, and beat Hearts once. You know I mean? And you think of the <laughs> amount of games that he was there for, that's not good enough. For a club where it's different way like Hearts and Hibs, and again, I'm not trying to injure up, right? Hearts are trying to re-establish themselves as to where they've been historically, which, which is third and fourth in the league, right? That's where Hearts have historically been. Hibs are trying to change their, their change standing the in Scottish football. They're trying to change where they are. They're trying to build. And Jack Ross was too happy to get a draw at Tynecastle or get a draw at Ibrox or, you know, get a draw away to Tan- at Tanadice and all that sort of stuff. Whereas... Mm. You can't build and change your your outlook or where you're standing in the league with that attitude. And I don't think Sean Maloney will have that. You don't play with Celtic and in the Champions League and get to play with the players that he's played with, settling for you know draws. I exactly, mate. And that's why I think give him time and invest in the team. Then I think you'll have probably. I don't see he's gone on a, a run this year. If I'm being honest with you, no, you maybe go on a run where you'll you'll. you'll consolidate top six and maybe fourth but I can't mm. see he's putting a run together to finish third or whatever because what is it 11 points or something uh, it's 10 it's 10 but and it's again it's like, you've got Motherwell away next so if you beat Motherwell away from him that'll be pretty impressive and you'll go to seven because we've got Celtic at home and I don't think Hearts will beat Celtic at home if I'm being honest with you and then you come into the Edinburgh Derby so there's still a chance you might but I think mm. in next year you'll start to see uh Maloney's worth for pre-season bit of investment getting new players in and all that sort of stuff I think I think Hibs are in a good place and I think Hearts are in a good place to and uh, Livingston will be in the Vida League so we're all we're all doing well like aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh Paul you're Sorry, taking Paul. this like a champ man no I think I think see if you'd said that comment three or four months back ah, yeah, you'd I would just give you a big man. tick in the box and went this is the season we go back to the championship but See the way we played there on Tuesday, even though we played against a fucking hefty pitch. Sure, on the team. But we looked like Barca in their prime. Mate, <laughs> see for see for <laughs> a thirty for that thirty minute period that, that the spaghetti had for us, you just were outrageous, man. Hearts gonna go the Hearts gonna go the the, the rain half, man. Craig Gordon, by the way, mate, what what a boy. By the way, what a boy. <laughs> He's outrageously good, isn't he? He is far too he's, good. He's, Hear that? He's inhuman. I was jo- I, I was laughing and joking about it, but you watched the Hearts goals for Tuesday night, mate. No, how is Andrew, how, how is Andrew Clark even in the conversation for getting a game with Scotland? What is he doing? What is he doing? He literally turns his back on the second goal. He like runs out and then jumps like that. I'm like, what are you oh, doing? No. Ah, he's oh, he's no. getting in like he's getting in like. <laughs> on that note, my final question, and again, it's going to be Hearts. What is your favourite Hearts kit over the years? Oh, oh he's, he's got, got it there. Hand. He's got it. Of course, he's got it there. Of course, he's got it. <laughs> it's that. I thought that. Is that a 98 one? No, it's 1992 or something like that. Oh, it's fucking my, well off. That top's older than me. It's my absolute belter. It's my favourite one. The Asics tops are pretty cool. I do also yeah. like this one. I do like this one too. Which is a. Uh, Pasquale Bruno wore that one. Another way to Pony. Just pretty, pretty decent. Pony. Pony made some good Pony made some good topes like. But I I'm yes. a sucker for a candy stripe. I actually love Hibs away top this year. The white one with the wee pinstripe yeah. green thing, mate. I think it's an absolute belter. I'd love to have a top. Our, our, our tops this year, mate. The three of them are just beautiful. No, I'm not Plus so keen on the I'm not so keen on the yellow one, like, but I like the I like the white one. I think it's a, I think it's a belter. Class man, didn't even get me started on Libby kits. It was our twenty fifth anniversary last season as a club, and they still didn't even acknowledge that. Aye, that's bad. Like, that's, that's get bad a Russell bad. Athletic job, man. Get a Russell Athletic number. Bring on back the new G kits, man. Bring. Aye, we've actually discussed this a few times as Libby supporters in different forums and all the podcasts and stuff that we've the two podcasts that we've got. <laughs> Um, and we don't have an identity like you really can't say like Livy's home colours are 
Golden Black to me. Aye, but if we started as black, but we stayed from Meadow Bank, who were Amber. Okay. Look, I kind of have this, we're in this situation today where like we women's football, right, where we are right now is you've got to take into consideration where you are. You just said there it's a 25 year anniversary, right? So 25 years for Hearts would have took you to what, 18 fucking 99 or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that was fucking, I think all the stuff that's went through every football club, all the ups, the downs, all the takeovers, failed stuff, like you, you've got to, that takes time. Identity is built through your history. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you find out who you are, what you are, what your colours are, traditions and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, I get a bit of that when I'm watching like women's football. I don't know why there seems to be this fucking hardcore group of men that just seem so offended by women's <laughs> football. And it's, we kind of live in that, this kind of world where we are constantly, as in Scottish football, compared to the English Premier League, the richest mm. league in the world with world superstars. That how that's not a barometer. That, that uh, is non-comparable. It's stupid. <laughs> if you're expect, if you're got to watch Dundee Livingston and want to see the standard of Liver- Liverpool Arsenal, you're deluded, mate. It's no, it's not going to happen. And it's the same if you go watch a women's team. I, I'm sorry, but the women's game's 17 years old or something like that. It's in its infancy. <laughs> If we went to 1874 and watched Hearts versus Hibs on fucking Logie Green, we'd have been appalled. It'd have been embarrassing. Uh, I mean, gum, yeah. jumpers for goalposts and folk running about like heedless chickens. It's like, you've got to let these things grow. That's how the women's game in 100 years' time will be probably every big, as big as I, the men's I game. Agree. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I don't 100%. just mean like the way you play and what your club's like. I mean generally like what are other clubs like? Obviously, it's black and yellow, really. but like, yeah. I just, I'm just, I'm raging. We need a good fucking kit. Right? We want a nice kit in years, man. You need liquidated. <laughs> I'm fucking sick of you. <laughs> right, that's set. <it>. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> do me the lid of that top. Fucking. Right, 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 corner, right, PC in the corner. Shut up and greet. <laughs> right. No, no. It's what? 2021. I'll cry on camera. Right, anyway. <laughs> Move on. Right. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Last bits and bobs there. Yeah, two, it. It's just about two and a half hours of your time. Uh, you're all right, my man. Uh, your heart's podcast. This is my story. Honestly, um, going through your tweets the night you've had some sensational guests on. Can I hope we've done well for ourselves, like to be honest with you. Uh, and start, we started with it just started like this, man. We were it was at a height of lockdown. Sick of doing family fucking quizzes on Zoom. Do you know what I mean? And missing talking to mates, missing being at a football, missing hating hearts. So I was like, let's get a fucking, let's get a Zoom call with the boys that are in the group chat, let's get a hearts quiz. Did a couple of them and started to go, it's actually quite funny. Like, do you know what I mean? Let's, and one of my mates was like, I've been messing about with, with stuff on Zoom and all that and recording it. And my missus was listening in last night when we were talking and thought it was quite funny. And I was like, well, I've always toyed about doing a podcast so why don't we get a bash so first couple of ones were absolute dog shit you know but it was at the height of us getting fucking the demo the demotion and the, the court fights and the legal battles and all that sort of stuff so we're fucking talking about fucking French football legal laws and all this stuff because of the leagues that had been called and all that and I was like oh, oh. who wants to listen to this shit man uh and then we just started, like you said, just doing what we're doing here, just start talking shit about your football team. What was your favourite game? What was your favourite kit? What, what did you love and what did you miss the most in that? We started to do a couple and then we started to get like, folks started to message you being like, because we've always said pub chat, like if you want proper analysis of hearts or you don't want bitter and jaded conversations, I said in the podcast for you because it's just five or six boys that love go to games and love bashing the club and praising the club and all the stuff that happens in pubs and clubs after football matches mm. and folks started to message us to be like oh, fucking like I've missed talking to my mates like this like listening to you talk about hearts is what we would do after a, a game or before a game or in the group chat and I mean, it grew arms and legs and then we started to like get messages for people being like this is really helping me get through lockdown I've been really low through lockdown and mm. I'm I'm big on all that sort of stuff. Eh? I'm big on like mental health because 
I have mental health problems myself and I was like, the things that help me the most through all that is to talk about it, get it out and open, tell folk what you feel, like Denny pent things up and all that sort of stuff and folks started to message to be like, you know, I really miss Hearts and I really miss going to the pub and I really miss all that. And we started to be like, fucking hell, man. Like, you forget the massive impact that football has on folk. It's not just mm-hmm. folk. It's not just folk playing football. Like, that's almost a sideshow. Like, do you know what I mean? Some your hearts and hibs and livy. Nine times out of ten, they ruin a fucking good day. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you've got to uh, got to watch them. Is the worst part about it. But everything else, at the moment, it's tremendous. So mm-hmm. through that, we started to be like. I know that Hearts and Hibs and Livingston and loads of clubs in Scotland actually, and I've called it out loads on our Twitter, that they never get anywhere near the credit today, but loads of the clubs do amazing things with community, mental health, man's mental health and all that sort of stuff. Motherwell are a shining light for it. And because we started to get all these messages, I, I messaged the club to be like, if we're getting them, I guarantee you the club's getting them. Like, do you know what I mean? People saying I miss it. Like, and... What I laugh and joke about saying it is it's not just like a packed lunchbox crew, like you know what you know what I'm talking about, the folk that hang about the game for a them to sign mm-hmm. a packed lunch and all that sort of stuff. These are like normal working class people that are at a low ebb saying by the <laughs> I'm fucking scunnered with foot football. So we started right. on the back of that on the podcast, we started then like we called them talk of the tune and it was like big we just got in contact with big hearts of the community and being like, Have you got people that are maybe vulnerable or low or need a bit of help in what I talk about hearts and just come on and do this, just do a big Zoom call and get 20, 20 boys on it, 20, 20 lassies and just talk shit about hearts and we started to do it and it started to grow arms and legs and then we would get like, started to get like Joel Sked and Rob Borthwick for uh, the Edinburgh and Evening News, we got John Cahoon came on, played with Hearts, came on our podcast, we'll get the guys for the fucking Andy Webster came on it, all that sort of stuff. And through that, we started to build like a relationship with the club to be like, they're not just like mental podcasters that talk shit and slam the club or whatever, but mm-hmm. actual got, got a bit of a movement. And for that, that's where we've been managing to like build links and ties with the club. So we've had like Jamie Walker came on, uh, we've had Josh Janelli came on. We've had Peter Haring, Cammy Devlin. I've been lucky enough to interview Joe Savage, who's our football director. I've interviewed Andrew McKinley, who's the CEO. I've interviewed Dan Budge two or three times. Uh, like we've been amazing to be involved in all it. And for that we shite the podcast. I was part of got invited by the club because they were like, we want some fan representation for the official handover for the foundation, FA and Budge to the Foundation of Hearts when the day that the Hearts, took, the Hearts fans took over the club. Mm-hmm. So I arranged, like you said at the start, I arranged and messaged all the podcasts, the Hearts podcast, to be like, look, we've been invited. Geez, what to come? Like, mm-hmm. it's an opportunity for you to be there. And like, made the game. It was only me. And I was like, well, I gave you the opportunity, mate. Like, I'm fucking here at history. I want my picture taken when the Sky Sports News are there and we're, they're handing over it and all that sort of stuff. And then on the back, it got to interview the uh, Budge and Stuart Wallace and Gary Halliday and that for the Foundation of Hearts. And it's went mental, mate. This The podcast this year, we've raised £8,000 or something like that for different, for two different charities. Made money, f- we raised money for the flag for Marius Salukas that was only cost us 400 quid to make the flag because they knew that it was for Marius Alucas and that it was M&D and all that. They knew the story, so they said they'd get it for 400 quid. We raised like £2,700 on top of that for mm-hmm. just Hearts fans donating. We did a GoFundMe saying, she chuck us a tenner and we'll make this flag. And folk, we end up wanting to shut it to be like, look, this is going to like just be a continuous stream of money. So we'll we'll pull it and we'll, we'll donate it to we ended up donating 2,700 quid to M&D Scotland on behalf of the Hearts fans and Marius Salouk is his name mm-hmm. uh, so I got to go meet the club through that and then we just did the thing where again the world of Scottish football that we live in and you'll have seen the headlines Hearts have decided to reduce Celtic and Rangers away allocation it's instead beautiful of, of course it is instead it's of giving them, beautiful instead of giving them 4,000 tickets we'll give them 8, 1,800 tickets and, you know, the, the, the headlines are, oh, thousands of Celtic fans locked out. And it's like, well, actually, why don't you 
why don't you do the positive and say thousands of Hearts fans allowed in? They're getting to see their team. Uh, oh, do you mean so? It's, it's eighteen hundred more Hearts fans that would have been there that wouldn't have got the opportunity to go. So we did it for Rangers, and we basically because it was coming up to Christmas, I actually seen a couple of Hearts fans do it themselves. They tweeted saying, "Look, I bought a ticket, an adult and a child ticket for the game, but I can't go." It's free to a good home. Don't worry about paying for it. Christmas is shite. It's a hard time of the year for money and that. Just take the ticket. It's yours. So mm-hmm. the six years were like, we'll chuck in 20 quid each and we'll buy two adult tickets, two kids tickets and get away as a gift for somebody make a family's Christmas. So we started with that. We, so that was four tickets. And by the end of it, because we put it on Twitter, it went viral basically from a Hearts fan perspective. We ended up getting away a hundred and 10 tickets or something like that raised over fucking £3,000 in money we gave away merchandise hearts kits hearts training gear hats and scarves fucking pies pints I went door to door with Gary Locke handing the tickets out like it's been it was outrageous man when you sit back and think fucking just a shitty wee hearts podcast and we've managed to make such a massive difference to the, the club has been it's been class. Like we even stopped them lifting the trophy last year. That was that was me. <laughs> so you, and, you did that. I. Uh, it was me. That was fucking priceless. And I didn't. I, I can remember just you know what I'm like. I'm fucking so opinionated and angry about everything. And I seen there. Uh, I seen something that Neil Doncaster that said something about had to be in talk. Just had talks with Hearts about uh, the presentation of the, the league trophy. And it fucking boiled my blood. I thought that after everything that that cunt has done this year, he's not getting inside Tyne Castle when I'm not always inside Tyne Castle. He's not getting to show up at the end of the year after demoting us and go, oh, see, it wasn't all that bad. You're back up anyway. Like, do you know what I mean? I was like, that's not happening. I'm also not having Hearts who just lost to Brora Rangers, lost to Queen of the South. I'm not having, I'm not watching those players lifting that wee diddy cup, pretending that it was an achievement. Like, they've been dug shite all season long. So we just like tweeted to say, fucking leave it on the stand, show the SPL that, you know, you can't be fucking mugged off. Do you know what I mean? And then ended up having to go to board fucking meetings and all that and chats and was on fucking, ended up on sports sound and all that sort of stuff, talking about it. It was brilliant, man. <laughs> just all because you're just like, nah, fuck the SFA. Not just me, but just Hearts fans. And that's uh, like, no, it was I, in general. And I think that's why hearts have engaged with us as a club is it's because football clubs they get so caught up in like making sure they're ticking all the right boxes so is it a nice place for families is it like do they have all the right stuff to encourage like a new generation of people coming and it's no out of malice or nothing but like the working class people that want to have a pint shout and swear and stand and sing kind of overlooked now right because it's no vogue to say that oh actually I'd prefer to have 10,000 of them in the stadium making all the, the noise it's better to say actually I'd, I'd rather we got fucking 5,000 families in because that's the next generation of Hearts fans right? I get it it's, it's how football works you have to be you have to be modern but uh, I think the club have realised that actually we're a direct line almost to the fan base like the fans we're, are. we're a pulse beat you can tell well so they, they tell us things and give us stuff and run things past us I've got a meeting next week with Hearts to go talk about safe standing uh, like we're going to they want us to talk about oh, bringing some standing in at Tyne Castle and all that sort of stuff so and how to get the atmosphere better what to do with ultras and if we can get ultras and how do we get them to be ultras and bring atmosphere but without singing bigotry and chucking flares and all the stuff that gets clubs into trouble and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff so like I think the clubs and it's not just hearts all the clubs are starting to they are starting to realise actually fan media is the biggest driver and anyway why do you want fucking Andy Walker that watches Hibs or Hearts once every four months if they're playing Celtic or Rangers coming in or writing in a paper telling you that Martin Boyle's overrated or fucking John Suter had every right to go to Rangers because they're he's they're a fud anyway of course they are but <laughs> they don't care and that's like the couple of times I've been on Sports Sound and spoke to folk it's they didn't have an answer eh? they were pure clamped I was talking to James McFadden and I hit out stats from last year about Robbie Nielsen being like, we haven't played the same consecutive back-to-back starting 11 for 28 games this season. Not a single academy prospect has played any minutes. And he mm. was like, uh, oh, I, I, I never knew that. that That's bad. 
And I'm like, they only they only picked up in the headline, which was Hearts fans protest because we got beat after Florida Rangers. And they're mm-hmm. going, I bet you're sitting top of the league, so that's fine. I'm like, I bet there's hundreds behind it. But you didn't know it because you're not a Hearts fan. And why would you care? Do you know what I mean? Why, why would you go to the, the, the digging to get the evidence to say, actually, Robin Nielsen probably isn't doing a good job? And it's the same that he's got with Jack Ross. When you sat Jack Ross, oh, that was out of order. You should never have sat him. I was like, well, actually, fucking take your straw out of his arse and do a bit of digging. You'll see, actually, he's had more than, more than his fair share of chances and hundreds and hundreds of shite results. Four points out of 36 it was. Aye. And getting oh, beat at, right? the way we got beat at Ammonville that night, it was like it's done. Yeah. Like, give me what I mean. It's I feel like no, it's exceptional. That's a badge as well. And we, up, we, we still are pretty by average. And that's what a couple of things we can pick up on. But we watched us get. I watched Hearts get beat five 0 at fucking Livingston. It was an embarrassment, an abomination of a football match. And Craig Levine kept his job. What is going on? What's going on now? Do you know what I mean? It was it was an embarrassment, but I I'm slightly jealous. You know where I was in a fucking Chinese restaurant in Motherwell because of my fucking girlfriend's brother's birthday at the time. No, lucky, <laughs> lucky, uh, lucky you, mate. I was neither. Cup I was final. Fuck, didn't you see I that? Five 0 thrashing their hearts at home. Didn't you see that? Yeah. However, yeah, a, I did see Jason Talbot absolutely milky Sam Nichols in <laughs> face. <laughs> that, yeah, was that was something to see in person today. <laughs> Aye, and got a booking. <laughs> I know. Mate, he did it against Dumbarton that same season. I didn't even get a, what was it? I didn't even get a foul. I didn't even get a car. <laughs> <laughs> and it was worse. I'd, I'd say it was worse at the two. Aye, it was bad. Do you know he's now playing for East Calder Colts? Does not fucking surprise me. Yeah. Does not East surprise Calder me. Colts? Shut up. Yep. That's that is, fucking is one of the teams. It was Cammy that was saying, you see, they either played against them or he's training with them, one of the two. <laughs> oh, no, that's metal. <laughs> Fucking, honestly, I'm well done everything you've done with that Hearts podcast, man, because... Yeah. I didn't even realise you had one, mate. <laughs> I didn't even know. Let's watch you now, bro. Kim and I noticed, right? Kim and I noticed, right? I'd, call, I'd actually tweeted on a... I can't remember what it was, but then this Hearts podcast is commenting, I'm going... I can exactly where that cheeky wee cunt is. <laughs> I can't go fucking anywhere. Uh, you can't go anywhere. You can't hide from Corbett when hearts are doing well. Hearts are losing, you'll never fucking hear from him, man. <laughs> like Honestly, right? I was like, he's got a fucking hearts podcast, fuck's sake. <laughs> only me, yeah. It could only be Corbett. Oh, I know. But fucking, honestly, mate, thanks for coming on, giving us nearly three hours of your time. No bother, my man. Like I said it was good. It was good chat. Let's let oh, me know good. what hap- let, let me know what happens with it. I'll uh, retweet it if you need any help or whatever, or fucking want me on again to talk shit or come on my podcast. Fucking feel free, boys. Hey, no worries, man. No worries, man. Well, I think for Andrew because technically it's, it is our podcast now, but it's in Andy's name. But you're definitely yeah. more than welcome to come on. No, hundred <laughs> percent. That was class. Brilliant, man. Brilliant people. I decided to come on tonight. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Liam, when you get in contact with you, it's uh, This Is My Story podcast on Twitter. Eh? I, it's weird because if you actually fucking search it, This Is My Story, it brings you up all sad stories about folk that are ill. So, we've had to get oh. the Twitter handle as this my, this my Story Pod or something. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, a word, there's a word missing. So, it's at This My Story Pod. <laughs> Aye, because when um, I was looking for it earlier, I was like... Aye. Do you know what's weird about it is I didn't even know until we, uh, we when we were thinking about names, I thought we contemplated you'll know us by our noise, right? But then obviously the connotations Aye. of that song, Hello, Hello, I was like, Aye, that's not fucking, that's not happening. It's the heart sing it day, but I, it's not going to be. No. Uh, but <laughs> folk are not going to like that. So we said, this is my story, right? It's fine, which is an acronym, spells Tim's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, for fuck's sake. I'm on a Tim's, I'm on a Tim's <laughs> podcast, man. <laughs> I went through you know what to sing, Hello, Hello, but now I'm a, now I'm a Tim. <laughs> oh, probably oh. me. PC, cheers for jumping on at last minute, man. I didn't think you were free My tonight. Pleasure, but man. That's been Liam Corbett. Check out the stories when it's out. Um, if you've got just about three hours of your time. <laughs> <laughs>
to your three four pop to, got absolute shite. Yeah, just to state something for the times here. Only here for the Bigby. Yeah. <laughs> only here for the Bigby's, mate. That's what you want. Exactly. Okay, what? Well, there's the title, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cheers, Leon. Right, boys. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers man. man.